Shalom and buenos dias. ABR is running a team from this past season of SPL. I've used it a couple times myself, and I really like it. It has not one, but both Magic Guard Psychic types. One is already difficult enough to deal with for most teams, and it's not easy to use them both because they tend to stack weaknesses, but if you can pull it off, it is downright terrifying. Another thing I like about this team is that every single Pokemon is immune to Sandstorm, and that is the main strength of this team. It is excellent against opposing Sand. It has a lot of ways to threaten with the double Magic Guard, and it is resilient. It does not fear entry hazards with four Spikes immune Pokemon and no Stealth Rock weeks. Uh, conversely, Solwyn's team is a blast from the past in a sense that Celebi is his only water resist. So Celebi used to be a big deal in Black and White and Black and White 2 as a specially defensive answer to most rain teams. And Golden Sun took it to the extreme on this one semi-stall team he had in Black and White 1, where he liked the other Pokemon on Sand so much, he didn't want to be bothered running a second water resist, and he just relied entirely on Celebi for it. And it worked really well. Uh, that team had a lot of tournament success. So Solwind is bringing that back, and I really like it because it's a lot to put on one Pokemon's shoulders, but Celebi is really tanky. It has recovery with... Uh, uh, recover of course and natural cure so status doesn't ruin it so it's resilient and it's not getting worn down by hazards because he has excadrill and by only having that one water resist that counters keldeo as well because not every water resist counters keldeo like ferrothorn and rotom then he is able to stack up on the pokemon that make sand strong as so he's focusing a lot on his strengths as opposed to just trying to cover weaknesses so I really admire that approach, and he gets to fit Skarmory, Gliscor, Exodrill, and Heatran all on the same team. Seeing two Skarmory in one game is really interesting, because Skarmory, by and large, has fallen out of the metagame because it's not very good against aggressive hazard stacking Ferrothorn, Tenacruel, Rain teams. So uh, Solwyn's team makes up for it by having his own Excadrill to spin, and... ABR's has the Reuniclus attack, but it's definitely not preferred. Both of these teams prefer to face opposing sand. So, a lot depends on the sets, of course. Like, uh, an HP Grass offensive Heatran would be really bad news for ABR, but a specially defensive set is not really a problem. Uh, so, for the sets on ABR's team that most people watching the game thought it might be, uh, I mean, obviously he could have changed them and almost certainly did, but the sets on the original team that were shown in SPL were standard Chopple T-Tar. You know, that can have whatever EVs and moves. It's still going to be a Chopple Tar. It's still going to check your Alakazams and Reuniclises and your Tornadises and Thunderuses and whatnot. I know there's Skarm and Gastro for the Genies, but always good to have backup. Anyway, Gliscor is a great set. It is Protect, Stealth Rock, Knock Off, and Earthquake. It is resilient. It chips the opponent like hell. The only exception is if the opponent has another Toxic Orb Pokemon, so their own Gliscor or a Breloom. And uh, Solwyn's got one of those. So, now uh, the Reuniclus is Calm Mind. I mean, it could be any combination of Lefties or Life Orb, and then for coverage, besides Calm Mind and Recovery, you got Psychic or Psyshock, and then Focus Blast or HP Ice or Thunder. For all we know, it's Acid Armor with Rocky Helmet, but. Uh, we don't know yet. We'll find out soon. Skarmory is Skarmory. It runs Leftovers as opposed to Rocky Helmet nowadays because it really needs to have longevity against Excadrill. As well as things like Tornadus. And uh, Alakazam, of course. Spadef Skarm is a pretty decent uh, Zam check. Gastro is Gastro. You know, recover and then you pick three of Scald, Ice Beam, Earth Power, Earthquake, Toxic. Uh, I mean, you could run Clear Smog for Reuniclus, but uh, it depends. A oh, Life Orb on Reuniclus with Psy Shock would be used to beat other Calm on Reuniclus. And then Zam is Zam. Uh, chances are it's going to be Sash. I mean, Life Orb with Sub is fine, but uh, given that Zam is this team's safety net because there's no Scarfer, Sash is a lot more likely. And we don't know what coverage it's going to use. You know, Psychic. And then ABR has talked about dropping Focus Blast in the past because Focus is just the worst move, and I agree. So finding other ways to muscle through things. You got HP Ice or HP Fire. You got Grass Knot for T-Tar, which hits it pretty much as hard as Focus Blast uh, when you take Chopple into account. 
Uh, signal beam, which I like, is an option, and would actually make it pretty threatening if he can get by Solwyn's Skarm, because it would mow through Celebi. Of course, he's got to hit a lot of Focus Plats against this team, so uh, who knows. But the reason I mentioned Celebi in particular is because Solwyn's Celebi, you know, back then, the set in Black and White 2 and or late Black and White 1, with Specially Defensive, was a U-turn set. Sometimes it had Parish Song. Because it was a great Reuniclus check, in fact. But I don't think we're going to be seeing that today. Well, I know what happens in the game. But I'm saying from a perspective of watching the game uh, live, quote-unquote, before knowing all the sets, then it's very unlikely that we're going to see a Parasong Celebi, considering that it hasn't been seen in like, seven years. So... Uh, the set that people have been using in black and white as of late has been some variant of Nasty Plot, because you can still be a bulky wall and fit Nasty Plot into your moveset. So that makes it a threat. And matter of fact, Nasty Plot, Giga Drain, HP Fire, Celebi. Without HP Fire, the Celebi is not a threat at all, and with HP Fire, it is a huge, huge, huge threat. And the only thing that would assuage it a little would be Zam hitting it with Signal Beam, which isn't even going to kill, so... And if it's Shadow Ball, then it just plus two Giga Drains off the damage it's taking. So, a lot depends on the sets, like I said. And, uh, yeah, let's get into it. Now, this game is long, morning, so I'm going to be skipping a lot of turns where uh, nothing but PP burning happens. So, we start off with Gliscor on Gliscor. Both protect because they have to respect each other's knockoff possibility. And then, that's a standard opening for Gliscor to get a Toxic Orb safely. And they both get a Brox, and they run a uh, knockoff into each other. So they are using the same exact set, and they cannot do much other than PP stall each other, unless they're willing to get something else knocked off. And I don't think ABR is going to want his Skarmory knocked off, considering that's really going to make it difficult to deal with Excadrill. Solwyn's ability to spin as well as lay hazards that ABR can't get rid of. I mean, look, four Pokemon's, uh, ABR's Pokemon are Spikes immune, but Spikes racking up on T-Tar and Gastro can still be pretty nasty, especially T-Tar, because Gastro can at least heal and delay it. You know, Skarm doesn't have infinite whirlwinds, but still. So we are seeing this... I mean, they really don't have much of a choice besides staying in here unless they're willing to give up those lefties, and Solwyn definitely isn't. And ABR at least has uh, the resilient Reuniclus and Gastrodon, and Gastrodon... Well, he can't really risk Gastrodon because he needs it to handle Heatran, so he decides to go with Reuniclus because Reuniclus is pretty much uh, similarly effective as uh, without leftovers. I mean, it's not going to suddenly stop being a dangerous threat with Calm Mind and Recover, although obviously Solwind loves Reuniclus not taking leftovers, so it can't passively heal. Uh, it has to actively use Recover, so we can burn Recover PP later, or just get a free switch when it's forced to Recover, things like that. He goes to Heatran on Reuniclus, and he uh, and uh, scouting for HP Ice, knowing that Reuniclus probably isn't going to pop off a Focus Blast immediately. Even if he does, then he can heal it off, because we see Leftovers on the Heatran, and we're going to assume it has some sort of bulk. ABR switches back to Gliscor, great move, not wasting any PP, very safe against whatever Solwind could do. As Solwind is not immediately threatening the Gliscor with death, I mean, unless this is an offensive HP Ice Heatran with Leftovers, which would be surprising. This team really appreciates Heatran's bulk to play around the plethora of dangerous special threats. You, know, you want Heatran to be tanking Thunderous T, not dying to it. So, he's got to run from that, he protects just to... Uh, I mean, if you can burn some Earthquake PP, because PP is going to be a big factor in this game, that'd be great. So, uh, he and arguably one could say that since Solwyn can spin, he probably should... Uh, this is nitpicking a little, but in a really long game like this, then every PP counts. And I realize how funny it sounds when I say PP over and over, so I'm going to ask that you just get over that. If it's tickling your funny bone. Yeah, so, uh, because Protect can be crucial and he can spend, so he's not really scrapping for every ounce of Heatran's health. Although it might not matter, minor. So he goes to uh, Gliscor, which I think he could have gone to in the first place. Because even if Solwyn double switches, or even if ABR double switches on the Protect, it's not like Heatran is suddenly going to be ripping things over. But... Uh, ABR scouts for HP Ice and doesn't 
so risklessly scouts for HP ice from the Heatran, a fast HP ice, and scouts the switch in in one fell swoop because he has a good matchup against Gliscor. Or not really, but he didn't burn any P uh, PP while doing so, which is crucial. So they're still feeling each other out. So Solon makes the safe move of absorbing uh, ABR's Gliscor with the zone. And we should probably turn off the Victory Road theme because it is time for the champion theme. Whoops. All right, so here we go. So now Gliscor is protecting on Gastro. It can eat an Ice Beam. Now, I don't know what kind of spread Soulwind is running on this Gliscor, but I would wager that, I mean, even if it's got physical defense, it probably has some spread effort. It could take an Ice Beam. Knocking off the Gastro would be nice because it would make Heatran a lot more dangerous, depending on the set. But it's also not something he really needs to risk yet. So he protects, reveals that Gastron does have Ice Beam. Not every set does that. Sometimes they like stabs and Toxic alongside Recover. Celebi comes in for free, and uh, well, not free. He's got to set up. He's got to recover, and ABR goes to Skarmory. So he's got a spike, and in comes the drill to relieve hazard pressure as ABR just goes for spikes. Rapid Spin has a lot of PP. He goes for Protect just to burn a Brave Bird, I suppose. Uh, I don't think that was a most necessary thing, but I don't think it was a bad move either. So he spins, and I mean, Glycer is going to get up the hazards over and over again, but. Extra Drill is frustratingly resilient, especially with Iron Head flinches giving it recovery, a la Jirachi. So, Skarm's Brave Bird will chip it down, but it's going to take a while, especially because it's going to have to roost eventually. But, uh, and it, if it ever lays spikes and forces a spin for more healing, then it gives Extra Drill more lefties as well. So, this is why some people like Rocky Helmet, Skarm, and it's still a good choice, of course. Uh, it can make life very irritating for Drill. And it can punish things like Scarf Lando U-Turn as well. It's a tough call. I, but if you're not so confident against Alakazam, like I would say most teams aren't, then I just think that uh, Lefties is definitely safer. So Rapid Spin has a lot of PP. It has more than stealth. It has twice as much as Stealth Rock and Spikes. And since Skarmory can throw up multiple layers, uh, so Extra Drill gets one spin for the price of you know two or three layers of spikes then uh, basically he's not going to have to worry about his rapid spins getting PP stalled and then having to deal with hazards after so anyway Gliscor comes in on Exca and then Solon goes to his own Excadrill he absorbs the knockoff with the Reuniclus again goes to Heatran the same exact sequence as earlier uh, comes into play Gliscor in on Tran ABR doubles to Gastro playing it very safe I agree with this entirely, and it's very heads up, not getting caught up in any needless risks, you know, because it w would be very unlikely that he's fast HP ice train on that team, but why risk it? So there's another protect from uh, from Solwyn, now he's got to switch back to Selby, so pretty much the exact same thing we saw earlier, except now Solwyn doubles to Gliscor, so he, rock he racks up 6% on the Celebi because it's not going to want to stay in because it would lose its leftovers and that would be a major pain in the ass and he can just absorb it with his own Gliscor at zero cost to himself so that is Solwyn's move here and that's what he does interestingly uh, if S Solwyn stayed in there with Celebi and Nasty plotted then that would have been dangerous because ABR makes a really ballsy move going back to Gastrodon so major props for that one because now it, it basically he's identified Gastrodon as his biggest source of pressure currently as opposed to trying to hero mode it with Reuniclus, and if he gets like a crit and a freeze and he can trap the Celebi with T-Tar safely, then Gastron is a major, major threat. So, uh, that's what he's going for here, and he's got to be careful because Ice Beam, he's already used twice and uh, Solon has Protect. He can pivot around it with Heatran, maybe, if he thinks he's he wants to be secure against uh, any Ice Beam shenanigans. Hell, he could maybe even go to Skarm, but he doesn't want to get Scald burned either, because that's also a fairly safe move. And uh, if Selby gets burned, it's uh, if Selby gets burned, then it's uh, easier for Titar to switch in and trap it. Interestingly, we don't have Sand yet, and Sand is going to make life harder for Soulwind because while he has five Sand immune Pokemon, the sixth is affected by it. Which would be a lot worse when the sand eventually goes up if it had taken that knockoff from Gliscor, so good on him. And if he doesn't have HP ice, if he doesn't have HP fire, then he's not getting through Scarb anyway. So uh, if he has HP ice or Earth power, then yeah, or uh, Psychic or something. But 
it, so it really wasn't worth it. So that was a good move, and therefore, you know, a fairly risky, but still a good move on ABR's end, because when a Pokemon may or may not have a move that destroys you, like if Selby has HP Fire, then Solwind is probably sweeping him anyway, because there's just very little he can do about it. So he can, so he's got to act like it doesn't have HP Fire. I mean, I'm sure he can try to pivot around it with Titar and you know maybe Zam like Encore a Nasty Plot if he has that, or just try to finish it off with. Uh, signal beam or shadow ball or something but by and large he has to play like he's not completely afraid of it because you know if he has HP fire he's boned anyway and if not then he's fine so he shouldn't let the fear of HP fire mess him up into making a worse play so yeah he's got the gastron thing going on sand isn't up yet uh, ABR wants sand to be up because his team likes it and Solwyn Celebi doesn't interestingly Solwyn's first username was Celebi 42 so, here comes... So maybe that's why he chose to use it, I don't know. So now uh, it's just constant switching as Solwyn goes to Celebi, and ABR does not go for Ice Beam. He goes to Gas... Her, he goes to Reuniclus as a risk-free uh, switch to Gliscor that would punish use of Protect. He would burn... Uh, Solwyn would burn a Protect without it having been useful, as opposed to Protecting on an Ice Beam, which would have been useful. So, uh, back to... So... so uh, excuse me. So then, we'll go back a turn, so with Celebi versus, or with Heatran, well, sorry, so uh, Gastro, Gastro was it on Gliscor, Solwyn switched to Celebi as ABR switched to Reuniclus, like we just said, to punish the Protect, and then, uh, since Solwyn didn't bother protecting and got the heads up with Celebi, recognizing he's going to want to be a little more conservative with his Protect PP, that he goes right to Heatran, and ABR goes to his Skarmory because Reuniclus cannot handle Nasty Plot Celebi one-on-one, -on -one, and he's got to just go to his check. So this uh, winds up being a very good move on Solwyn's end, as uh, he both doesn't mess around with his Celebi and keeps uh, the edge against ABR's Celebi check and Scarp. So that was very heads up by him, as opposed because a lot of players might just go for the Nasty Plot. Uh, just to pressure the Reuniclus, but Heatran was a switch earlier and he was sticking to it. And he's keeping ABR in the dark. You know, maybe his Celebi is just a support set. So, uh, way to conserve information. And now we see Roar from Heatran. Roar is a forgotten relic on Tran. It used to be super standard, and I was its biggest fan. I never left home without my rocks, Protect, Lava Plume, Roar, Heatran. And now, the problem is that ABR's team is so hazard resilient that it's not really getting him too far. I mean, he wrote out Gastrodon, that's nice, but uh, what he's trying to do, or what he can do with these roars, is because uh, if it's a, just a standard Lava Plume Heatran, then Gliscor will wall it, and Gastrodon's still going to get in its way. So what I'm um, thinking he's going to try to be doing is dragging in Titar, who runs Chopple, therefore no lefties, and if he can wear down Titar by forcing it in with Roar to take Stealth Rocket over and over, excuse me, that makes Celebi a lot more dangerous. And he can potentially do the same, although instead of 12.5% at a time, it'll be 6.25% at a time against Skarmory, because Skarmory will not want to stay in, so he can just keep roaring over and over. And this is an underrated application of Roar, forcing Pokemon to take, uh, to come in and take damage when you don't want them to. And uh, I think, you know, Roar is primarily used as a defensive technique, but it can be incredible offensively as well. You don't see that too often, so I'm appreciating it here. So here comes Zam. Solon doesn't want to mess around with it. He's not risking anything, so he just goes for Lava Plume. ABR gets his Gliscor in safely. So the move for Solon is just back to, back to his own Gliscor, not risking anything. ABR goes for Knockoff because it has a lot more PP than Earthquake, so no sense burning any. So now we're in another Gliscor war, and we're skipping ahead, and now uh, ABR manages to get his Reuniclus in uh, as Solon goes for a Stealth Rock to waste PP. So back to Heatran, and we're thinking, well, why Heatran the switch? And then we see it, it's Sub Protect Roar Heatran, which is an awesome set. Uh, it's, it was used a couple times a long time ago in DPP, and I tried it in black and white a couple times, and my team with it was not so good, but the set was great. And I give massive props to Solwyn for using this one because it is so nasty. Because with Sub and Protect, you can PP stall things like Gliscor's Earthquake. And with Roar, you can do exactly what he's doing here. That was the idea when 
I was trying it, and someone is using it to much better effect than I ever did. So, uh, we see Reuniclus's cover, well, at least part of Reuniclus's coverage, is that it has Thunder, so it's not going to have Thunder and Focus Blast. So the second move is going to be HP Ice or, um, or Psychic or Psyshock. So, there's that, and he misses a Thunder, and now Solwyn doesn't bother protecting, because, uh, as... He just goes for Recover, which would be good against Protect, but he just roars, and now Skarm is in, losing more health, so Tran is looking really threatening. He can keep roaring over and over, and he goes for a Plume as Gliscor comes in. Now, I get the temptation there. I mean, it's very easy for me to say, well, he could never risk Skarmory because then he loses the Celebi, yada, 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 uh, and he's still a little too high to be defeated by an HP Ice Celebi. So it's very easy for me to say he just should have kept roaring, but uh, you never know when someone like ABR is going to... I mean, it's. I don't think it was good risk versus reward to stay in like that. Um, to stay... to... Because, think about it like this. Even if you're thinking, oh, I need my Skarm, and that's exactly why I'm gonna Roost, it doesn't outweigh the fact that you can just keep switching to Gliscor, and eventually uh, Solwind is going to whirlwind, roar in your Gastro or something that can break the sub or just mess with the Tran more. You know, it's likelier that you're going to break the sub and be able to deal with it as opposed to you know risking your Skarm and thus the entire game. So that's why I don't think he was ever going to stay in, but I can absolutely see why Solwind would not want to take that chance and just have his whole progress on Skarm ruined. I mean, he can still go for the T-Tar thing, but keeping Skarm down is really nice for extra drill as well, not having to deal with spikes. Skarm can't come back in and get him up. Celebi's massively threatening the works. So I can absolutely see why he Lava Plume, and I don't think that was a bad play at all. So, obviously, while we can say in retrospect, or even at the time, that Roar would have been better, given the risk versus reward of it all, uh, you can't fault him for it at all. Uh, so, uh, Gliscor comes in, he's protecting, because he's wasting PP, he uh, burns a Lava Plume, pun intended, and, uh, of course, now he's using, using his first Earthquake. So, he roars in Gastrodon, not quite what he was hoping for, but it's fine, because he can go Celebi, uh, unfortunately, he's going to be forced to recover here, which means either Skarmory can heal up or T-Tar can come in and trap. Both are not so desirable, but, uh, you know, he'll take the Skarmory because he can just reset the rocks and the spikes with the extra drill. So, ABR goes for the good move and whirlwinds the extra drill. Of course, Exca is famous because it outheals Stealth. It's one of the few Pokemon in the game that outheals Stealth Rock with leftovers. I think the only others are Steelix and Cabalion. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think those are the only ones. Unless there's a new Pokemon I'm not familiar with. But, uh, yeah, so he whirlwinds it out, and Heatran comes back in. So now he doesn't even... Uh, so, he didn't roost up, uh, so, and that was, you know, a good idea in theory, because he, you know, chips the extra drill just a little bit. Or, you know, even better, chips the Heatran. That would have been great, because Heatran would take 12.5, roughly 18.5 uh, if extra drill didn't spin, because it would take 12.5, then 12.5 again, uh, minus a leftovers recovery. So that was what he was aiming for, but it also means that while he effectively, well, so effectively didn't chip Skarmory from where it was before, it also didn't get to be any higher, so he can try it again. And now he goes for the Lava Plume again, and, you know, tough to really find fault with that. So ABR is going to stay in, not just to be safe against the Tran, but to gain uh, Leftovers Recovery. It's the same principle to sometimes Swampert stays in on Salamence, uh, in advance and just throws out an attack, not because it, it doesn't think Salamence is switching, but just because it needs extra rounds of leftovers. So, uh, we see the same knockoff into Reuniclus thing again, and now that Reuniclus has shown Thunder, we know it doesn't have Focus Blast, so Extra Drill is completely safe against it. So, Solwyn uses that as a, uh, as a switch in. So, he uses that to switch into it, and ABR continues to make the smart move of going back to Gliscor, you know, not wasting PP and being able to pressure Solwind into Gliscor of his own. And, you know, maybe this would be a great time to go to Gastrodon and fire off another Ice Beam. Selby doesn't have infinite recovers. Gastrodon doesn't also have infinite Ice Beams. Matter of fact, it already has one less Ice Beam than Selby has recovers, but it's a thought. You know, he can try to double to uh, T-Tar or something. Uh, if the bulky Selby has Baton Pass, it escapes Pursuit, but if it has U-Turn, it doesn't, so. And of course, if it has, uh, if it doesn't have U-Turn, if it's the Nasty Plot Recover set, then of course it's not going to escape it at all, so. 
uh, yeah, that's where we are. This is a great game in terms of showing how to manage longer games in terms of PP and not me not wasting things you don't need. It's uh, I think you can learn a lot from how these guys are playing this game on both ends. So he goes to Gastron again, and Excredo protects. A uh, good move. He gets back up to full. I don't think that was really necessary, but it's you know splitting hairs. So. Uh, now he's got the Gastron in on, you know, either the extra drill if it protects or Gliscor if it stays in. So another lesson, you know, win-win plays. Constantly be looking for those. So, and now back to Gliscor again as extra drill protects again because either Gliscor comes in on Solwyn's Gliscor, which means that, you know, nothing was lost, you didn't waste any PP, or you have this matchup again against extra drill and that's completely fine. So again, you're looking for the win-win moves as much as you can, and ABR keeps making them. So, uh, yeah, I really like that. And again, he goes back to Gastrodon, completely fine, and he gets that Gliscor one-on-one. The only thing he has to be careful about is going to is ice beaming on Protect, but he goes back to Gliscor once again and going to sell it because again, so here Gliscor switched into the Gliscor, right? And the other option for Solwind, besides protecting on Ice Beam to try and burn a PP, was to go to Celebi to uh, switch to eat it up. And Gliscor against Celebi is not necessarily a good 1v1 in a vacuum, but if you know you can provoke him into showing HP Ice and letting your Skarm heal, or you can consider if you're healthy enough for it, or if you're bulky enough for it, to knocking it off, which would make it a lot easier to deal with. So. It was a safe, good move either way. You know, he's not exactly rife with good options. Because he can't exactly double to Skarmory from the Gastrodon against the Gliscor in hopes of catching the Celebi, because what if Gliscor goes for the knockoff? You know, then Skarmory's ruined. And if he goes for the knockoff against Gliscor, you know, knockoff or protect against Gastrodon if Gliscor stays in, Gliscor, uh, then ABR's own Gliscor doesn't care about it at all. And if he goes to Celebi, then it's fine for the reasons we just outlined. So now we have another Gliscor Stall War. Back to Reunclus on Stealth Rock again. Here comes Excadrill. Another switch back to Gliscor from ABR. Really keeping it up. And so this makes it sound like ABR is just running circles around Solwind. But that's not the case. Solwind knows what the situation is. And he's not risking anything either. I mean, eventually one of these guys is going to have to make some sort of push to get by the other guy. But for now, Solwyn knows, you know, all these switches are nice and all. And, you know, maybe he wants to be a little careful with his PP, but he's still in a fine position. Because, you know, he's not getting worn down. I mean, there's not even sand up. There's not really a good spot for either T-Tar to switch into. So, and uh, Solwyn just definitely wants to preserve his T-Tar for the Psychics. And ABR wants it for Celebi. So, uh, they're not eager to switch into... Uh, anything so far so uh, we're still getting a reserve game from both ends and I just wanted to highlight that uh, Solwind is not letting himself get beaten here he's playing it safely because he knows he can and that's how it should be there I mean look sometimes you are going to have to take risks in games but not when you don't have to that is a stupid pointless way of uh, losing games that you shouldn't be losing. And matter of fact, that might be some foreshadowing for later. What? Anyway, so Extra Drill goes back to Ga uh, Gliscor, and uh, ABR makes another great move back to Gliscor, just constantly switching back and forth. And Solwyn's, you know, I mean, good uh, work on that, but Solwyn is not getting chipped at all. The only time ABR is ever going to be able to actually chip him is either by PP stalling Protect, yeah. How great is competitive Pokemon? So I, I know that sounds sarcastic, but you know that's just how deep the game can run sometimes. That one of your best options is PP stalling protect. See, because right now he's going to go back to Gliscor, I'm pretty much guaranteed. Now, this is a long game. I don't have it memorized, but I would be shocked if he didn't. For the same reasons, you know, Gliscor either knocks or protects, or uh, knocks or protects, or switches to Celebi, and that's fine for Gliscor for all the reasons we've already gone over. And even if ABR, you know, or even if Solwind loses his mind and switches to something else, it's not like any other switch on Solwind's team is so damaging to a Gliscor double that he can afford not to make it. You know, this is the kind of play you want to have at your disposal. The one that, you know, no matter, like, ABR could tell Solwind, hey, I'm switching back to Gliscor here. And, you know, it would change very little because, you know, worst case, he has that one-on-one -on -one against Celebi, which we already talked about, which is a very real possibility 
and that's part of the reason why it's such a good play in the first place. If that's your worst case, then fine. So, Celebi, uh, and he goes for Ice Beam, so, <laughs> well, that makes me look dumb. He goes back to Gliscor because it's, sa it's safe against Celebi, or he goes for Ice Beam against Celebi. Uh, I stand by what I said, of course, but uh, eventually he does go for Ice Beam because he's trying to you know, freeze or crit the Celebi and put it into a position where he can knock it down, and that's what I meant by pushing past it. Uh, pushing past the other guy. Eventually, you're not going to be able to just switch around like this the entire game. Eventually, you're going to have to do that. But the Gliscor switch, which he pulled off however many times before that, was a perfect example of why he doesn't have to risk anything. And, you know, he's he could let Soulwind overextend himself with Protect. Matter of fact, that Ice Beam uh, was a great move because he knows Soulwind has to be careful with Protect now uh, because otherwise he's just going to get switch stalled by ABR because uh, neither player is really chipping the other right now, and that gives him a perfect opportunity to go for Ice Beam. So very heads-up play there, and uh, please excuse my, excuse my foolishness. I lost track of the idea that Solwind might want to be conservative of his Protect PP, as he very well should have, and ABR very correctly read that and uh, went for Ice Beam. So, I mean, it might seem like, oh, he's 13 out of 16 Protects left. Why are you so worried about that? How could he read that? No, he has, because he's been switch stalling all the time, and there's no sense protecting against a guy you know is switch stalling. So, and uh, maybe Solwyn's Gliscor is super focused on physical defense to handle things like Terrakion mainly. So, uh, he doesn't want to be taking an Ice Beam. So, because otherwise, you know, knocking off that Gastrodon would be really huge if he could get it. But it's uh, hard to do that without getting, uh, without eating an ice beam, which he might not want to do. And you know, there's no other way to get the knockoff on Gastrodon because every time Solwyn threatens a knockoff with his Gliscor, ABR is switching to Gastron or Uniclus and you know parking them in front of it, or just you know parking Gl his own Gliscor in front of Solwyn's Gliscor. And uh, you know, he's never. If the Gliscor is ever going to knock off the Gastron, it's going to be at the cost of eating an Ice Beam. And I think that's a very important distinction to be aware of. So, Celebi, you know, recovers, and ABR is going to go back to Skarm, heal that guy up. Excadrill comes in, trying to reset. Not healing up. He, uh, Whirlwind's Excadrill brings in Heatran once again. He's also aiming to wear down the, the, the T Tar as well, actually. I should have mentioned that earlier. Wear down the T Tar to make it easier for his Psychics. That's the goal, but he doesn't get the Whirlwind, and now Solwyn goes to his own Skarm on the Gliscor for the first time. He's like, can I get some spikes? You know, that might help against Gastro and Titar, especially Titar. That really accelerates the process. But he doesn't want to risk the, uh, the, I think he was aiming for Gastrodon, because he doesn't want to eat a knockoff, because he's just, oh, he does want to eat a knockoff. Okay, that surprised me, honestly. But at the same time, I guess he, uh... He figured, you know what, no sense sticking around. I'm going to get my massive ha uh, amounts of hazards in exchange for this knockoff. So that's good. That's a tangible benefit. And Skarmory, I think he's generally decent enough against Alakazam to where the loss of leftovers is not going to kill him. And the reward is pretty big. So I can, uh, well, maybe I would have been a little more conservative with that. I guess he wanted to avoid that cycle of Gliscor and a Gliscor. And then Gastron manages to find its way in. Or Reuniclus finds its way in. Reuniclus finds its way in, and then Gastrodon finds its way in against Exodrill or Heatran, and then Celebi Ice Beam stuff. So we, he wanted to start being more aggressive, especially because if he uh, lays down hazards, then uh, Titar has a lot tougher time beating down Celebi. So if he can handle the Skarmory somehow, then eventually his Celebi is going to win. That's the assumption. So uh, Exodrill comes in on Skarm, resets uh, ABR's hazards, so not a great scenario. And, you know, because he can't even protect to uh, PP stall spin. And eventually Skarm's going to heal up, but he's not beating the extra drill at all. I mean, he can annoy extra drills Iron Head and Earthquake PP, but, you know, he's just going to keep losing the hazards every time. So, and not taking any risks at all. Remember, uh, for those, because I know a lot of in more inexperienced players sometimes make moves to not be predictable, but it doesn't matter how predictable a move is if your opponent can't do anything about it. And, you know, so that's why, you know, Rapid Spin every single time. You know, what's ABR going to do about it? That's the, the kind of thing you have a uh, goal for. Like, uh, to take a, an extreme stupid example, if you have a Darmanitan and Sun against a team with, 
that you know with a team I guess a team that dies entire to flare blitz then you're not gonna not use flare blitz because it's predictable you know you could tell your opponent hey I'm using flare blitz here and they would still have to it wouldn't change anything so that's the kind of thing where uh, that's the kind of thing we have going on here. So Gliscor again, Gliscor gets the rocks up, and the rocks will stay up until Exodrill manages to find its way back in on Reuniclus. And, um, oh, I wanted to highlight that move, so we're going to go back and potentially freeze the replay. Um, so rocks are going to stay up until Exodrill finds its way back in, but ABR was, has famously, or not famously, has been uh, very consistent in not letting Exodrill in for free against Reuniclus. But at the same time, even when you double against Exodrill, that's part of the reason Exca is so good, is that uh, you can't wear it down with Stealth Rock. It heals off Stealth Rock. You know, it's more resilient than Torn T. Uh, maybe not statistically, but whatever. Um, point being that, so Gliscor in on Gliscor now, and Solon makes a really heads-up move here in going for Earthquake because he noticed that ABR had been PP stalling his, you know, Stealth Rocks and knockoffs with Reuniclus switches, which he then uh, would exploit by Reuniclus being at full health. So now, if Reuniclus wants to double, he's still at lower health for later, and that can be crucial for his T-Tar. So that was a really great move on Solwyn's end, uh, and really heads up. So massive props for that one. Uh, just noticing how ABR was dealing with it and eventually making a move. It's not a huge move, it's not game-breaking, but it's the little kind of incremental advantage that you look for in a game as tough to handle as this one. So, Extra Duel comes in, and ABR makes the back to Gliscor move. It would absorb uh, Solwyn's Gliscor further, and it covers Extra Duel. And Solwyn's like, fine, well, my Extra Duel didn't, you know, no sweat off my back. So... Uh, now he goes back to Gastron, and with the spike up, you already see Gastron getting a little more uncomfortable. I mean, it's only a little bit, but it's there. So now he protects and burns an Ice Beam successfully, so nice move from Solwyn in there. So he mixed it up, uh, so ABR previously knew that he wasn't going to be protecting uh, because he wanted to be more conservative with the PP, and this time Solwyn said, I'm going for that protect, especially because Gastron can't switch around as freely now. I think that was also a factor in the decision, and now went to Celebi and eats the crit, which is rough. So he keeps going to Skarmory. I think he really wants to preserve the T-Tar as a method of handling Heatran, uh, especially because with the hazards now, then T-Tar against Celebi one-on-one -on -one can get ugly, especially because he doesn't know the set yet. So Solon's done a great job at not popping Nasty Plot off. Uh, needlessly, because if he has HP fire, it's a threat no matter what. If he doesn't have HP fire, then it's not getting past Scarm no matter what. So no need to reveal that you don't have baton, baton pass, and thus no need to reveal that you um, can or cannot get past, escape a T-Tar pursuit safely. You know, because if ABR sacks T-Tar to uh, a Celebi that isn't a threat to begin with, then that can be that can come in crucial later, especially when Heatran's roaring around. He's scrambling for options against it, so he's making the right move, but with this uh, Skarm approach. So great moves from both guys. I can't stress that enough. As we approach turn 100, Extra Duel comes back in. Whirlwind, Celebi. He's not getting uh, T-Tar back in, but it's certainly better than Heatran. Extra Duel coming back in. He's not dicking around praying for anything and now he gets Gliscor in so that's the problem with Scar Whirlwinding he has like one he has two good targets you know mostly just T-Tar but he also has uh, several targets you know half of Solwyn's team is uh, also a good option against it so even if he switches excuse me in one then there are two others that could very well just uh, come in that's a 40% chance of Whirlwinding in something that you don't want to see uh, and uh, if if that one of those three comes in. So, Excadrill comes back in yet again. Uh, I'm not sure about that one because Gliscor was very obviously coming into Solwyn's Gliscor uh, because ABR cannot risk knockoff on Skarmory ever. So, uh, I'm not sure about that extra switch, but it's still not too much of a problem because Extra doesn't lose anything and he manages to burn an Earthquake. Uh, maybe Solwyn, he thought... Uh, that Solon would just get the spin off, but but he goes for an earthquake that can be huge against Heatran later because we know that substitute and protect is famous for burning through PP like nothing. Solon makes a good move. ABR winds up wasting an earthquake, and now here comes Reuniclus again. 
And here's where that earlier earthquake is nice. Because again, he goes to extra drill, but even if Reunclus keeps doubling, it has to recover at some point. And if it just keeps doubling, it's never going to heal. So that's why the knockoff was crucial. So Gliscor on Gliscor again, knockoff again. Stall War, turn 100, Reuniclus Switch eats another knockoff for another 6%. Extradol comes in, eventually it's going to recover, and Extradol is going to get the spin off. So, uh, Gliscor is going to come back in, get the rocks up, but, you know, no, no skin off its back. Gliscor comes back in, the Stall War continues, Reuniclus continues, and we're in this little cycle, so someone's going to have to break it eventually. So, ABR makes the double to Gastrodon on Extradol this time. So, I uh, protects on a Scald. So I think I think Selby was safe enough there to you know to switch in even if uh, with, so I don't think the protect was necessary there. It just gave Gastrodon more HP if anything. So I think that protect I actually disagree with as opposed to being ambivalent or not really minding. So Selby Gliscor double Gliscor back Reuniclus in comes Excadrill double to Gliscor. Here comes Skarmory as Gliscor comes in has to fear knockoff. So X. So Solon goes back to Excadrill on Gliscor again. Um, no, I, I think at that point, he maybe he was just going to Excadrill because it doesn't lose him any HP and it doesn't burn any PP. In case, so he doesn't knock off into ABR's Gliscor. So I agree with that a little more now after thinking about it a bit more. So uh, we're in this cycle again. And uh, now back to Solon's own Gliscor. Gastron coming in. It's getting chipped. Once Solon manages to find that third layer of spikes, then it's going to be really ugly. So Selby comes in, not wasting any uh, protect against the Gastrodon because it, it's likelier that he just goes for the safe Scald, which could be a reason to knock it off, but at the same time, not risking it. So Solon finally reveals his first non-recover move, but the only thing that does is dispel any doubt that he's a nasty plot leaf storm set, which was incredibly obscure to begin with. Uh, so, at least now he knows that uh, T-Tar's not going to get blown away by a plus 2 Leaf Storm, and it's Giga Drain, but I think you expect Giga Drain 9 games out of 10, if not more, anyway. So, he chips Gliscor a little, goes back to his own Gliscor, double to Reuniclus, can't hit Excadrill, Excadrill comes back in, and he call Mines. So, non-lefties Reuniclus against Excadrill is... Um, is not great. So Solon makes a great move. He knows he doesn't have Focus Blast, and he doesn't want to eat a plus two uh, Psy Shock because Extradrill is bulky and resists the move, but he doesn't want to take it because that could add up later against Skarmory Brave Birds. He, it could be unnecessary. So he finally reveals his T-Tar against a Reunicless that can't hurt outside of Thunder, and he decides not to dick around. He's just going to go right for a Crunch. He, uh, because Skarmory comes in, you know, who cares? I mean, now his Celebi does have to be a little more careful of hazards. Um, but at the same time, he's, he, I think he's still in a good spot. So Sand doesn't come up until turn 119 in the Sand on Sand game. That's pretty great. And Soen goes to Heatran to try and pressure with the spikes down. And ABR goes for the spike as opposed to the roost. I mean, T-Tar could run Fire Blast, but at this point, you know, especially defensive Skarm can shrug off T-Tar Fire Blast. It's not going to be invested. And at this point, you got to pressure somehow. So that method is spikes. And now Soulwind fires off the roar, chips a little on Gliscor, at, but brings in Zam and is thus forced to Lava Plume. So... He's not risking a fast Gliscor set as Gliscor comes back in. So, uh, I agree with the Lava Plume. No sense dicking around against against uh, Heatran. And now this Stall War serves more purpose in getting ABR's Gliscor back to full health. So, I was thinking maybe uh, here. And then he could have gone to Skarm and gotten his third spike. Because if all Gliscor is doing is getting health and you're just wasting PP, I don't think that's really worth it. But if he went to Skarm and gets this Gliscor, then he would have said, Alright, you're getting your health back, but I'm getting my third layer of spikes, and now your Gastrodon's really going to hate it. So, I think that would have been better. Uh, so, Arena Gliss comes back in again. And it also uh, kind of bites because now uh, ABR has rocks and spikes, and you can bet that he's going to do everything possible to make it really difficult for Excadrill to spin them without... Uh, being in against Gastrodon or Gliscor. So here we see it come in. Yeah, Gliscor again, and now Excadrill can't heal so well. It's got to burn Protect if it's wanting to shrug off spikes. Excadrill sh uh, shrugs off uh, Stealth Rock, and of course it's immune to sand, so one layer of spikes isn't the end of the world, but it can add up. I mean, look, he's still losing 3% net, but 
that can actually add up because he only has 10 protect PP. You know, to you that to you the average battler. Wow, that sounded condescending. I'm sorry, but to people who are not experienced in this kind of uh, prolonged stall format, then um, in the style of game, I mean, I don't mean that black and white is a stall meta game because it's not, for the most part. Um, and one game doesn't prove any different. But point being that Gliss score that um that is the kind of incremental advantage that could really start bringing him down, especially if. Uh, he tries to switch in on Scar and Whirlwind. That would be really bad because he's not even getting the leftovers recovery. And 3% is a lot. So, uh, as we see from there. So, see, he's going to keep doing this. He's not going to... You know, he can't stay in and knock or Earthquake the Reuniclus. Uh, you know, even if he thinks he's going to live in HPI. Oh, he doesn't ha have to do that, actually, because he knows he has a Shock. But he's just going to keep going back to Gliscor. So... And he can't really switch to anything else. He can't switch to Heatran. He can't switch to Skarm. He can't switch to Celebi. As now Celebi is actually... You know, if Celebi gets caught on a double switch, then it takes... Uh, it gets thrown down to 75%. And it has to switch away from Gliscor's HP Ice. And... Not HP Ice, sorry. Knockoff. It, you know, because we don't think it's threatening with HP Ice. It might have popped that earlier in that scenario where it uh, Giga Drained. But yeah, so now Exodrill is actually in trouble, and uh, Celebi's in trouble, so that decision to go to Heatran, I think, on the Skarm Spike was a mistake, because if he just constantly prevents ABR from getting hazards, then, then you know, ABR is going to have to try to force his way through just with the Pokemon. But if he does get hazards, then, you know, the strength of Exodrill is that it makes you not have to deal with hazards so easily. So when you do, suddenly then things start to fall apart. And uh, so I think that going to trans switch was a mistake because the benefit of roaring around with spikes was not nearly as important or uh, tangible as keeping spikes off pretty much indefinitely, whereas now he has to deal with both. So extra deal comes in, protects, and he eats a knockoff, and yikes. So now extra drill is, is boned. It, it loses a Skarm one-on-one. -on -one. It obviously has to run like hell from Gliscor. Uh, uh, that, that was not worth it at all. So, I mean, he put himself in the bad position with the Heatran switch. Um, and now, you know, he doesn't even have to... I mean, he could have gotten a Skarm and not really been too scared about Reuniclus, but he kept opening himself up to double switches, with it, which ABR was doing all over the place. So I think Solon got... Uh, it, in Solon's own words, he got impatient. Which, you know, is natural. He finally gets the third layer of spikes he should have earlier, and now he's going to try and hack Solwyn's team apart with... Or, ABR's team apart with Hazards. You know, Gastrodon uses its first recover, and now he finally drags an ABR's T-Tar, taking massive damage. And he gets crit by Fire Blast, which really, really bites. I, that That is unlucky. No two ways about that. That really made things harder for Solwyn, because there's no way that was coming anywhere close to KOing. Uh, but... At the same time, he put himself in a bad position uh, prior to that. You know, it, it's it's a shame because long games like this are really hard to maintain concentration in. So uh, it's natural, even at the highest stage, to have a minor lapse like that. Especially because Heatran was you know threatening. So you know, a couple different roars like in Titar, and maybe we'd be singing a different tune. But uh, you know, with ABR's propensity for doubling for safe, easy doubles already, you know, those are. Kind, those are, as we saw, those doubles he was constantly making, without hazards, they're nice, but they're not necessarily getting him anywhere unless he moves forward with them somehow, i.e. trying to trap the Celebi or trying to crit or freeze it somehow with Gastrodon. Or, uh, but, you know, as soon as those hazards go up, then you, then Solon went from making these switches that ABR could easily predict but couldn't really do much about to these switches that he could easily safely predict and punish him for. So that was the bad position. Extra Duel comes in now. It's on a timer uh, with its spinning, and he's you know gonna try and oh he's not gonna try and flinch it down. So you know he can spin once or twice. Uh, he Iron Heads there because he didn't want to lose Extra Duel for free too. And Extra uh, Extra Duel will still be able to spin several more times, but it's gonna be uh, it's still gonna be a problem. And you know if he kept its leftovers and didn't get put himself into a position where he ha felt like he had to take that risk because of how open he was to constant doubling then that then uh then yeah we we already know and i'm i don't want to rehash that so now heatran's got to go hero mode pretty much and he roars the gliscor in comes skarm uh this is another reason why you like leftovers on skarm 
uh, although Roar isn't too common in black and white. He brings in T-Tar, uh, and he switches out in ABR Pursuits. Now, that was an interesting move, and I think what it means was that ABR did not have a move to hit Heatran with, as opposed to predicting the switch, because if it's sub Heatran, then... I, w I was personally surprised that Solwyn did not go for the sub, just to scout the move. But, just to scout the superpower, you know, so maybe he can beat the T-Tar one-on-one and continue the Rampage later. Especially because, after handling T-Tar, then Heatran's role is limited. You know, that's because it's not getting by all these guys. It doesn't have enough PP to do so. So... Uh, so I think that was the case. I mean, I could be wrong. ABR could have just predicted him to preserve the Heatran, but... Because, uh, you know, the Pursuit wasn't a huge reward, and matter of fact, I think he definitely didn't have it because if he trans subs on your predicted Pursuit, you know, that's just a waste. I get that you can still superpower uh, before he roars, but, you know, if he Lava Plume, I don't know. I, I don't think that was... I could see it either way, but I would lean 60-40, maybe a little more, that he did not have superpower. Especially because T-Tar likes other moves. Like uh, Crunch, Pursuit, Fire Blast, Ice Beam. Thunder Wave is great to mess with Zam one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, second Stealth Rock is always a good call. But I, uh, you know, but he could have just been predicting. I, I thought, I don't think that was worth it really, because you know, 60% plus rocks. That's not the thing that's going to break the. That's not going to break the Heatran. That's not going to change how you deal with it. I mean, it's nice, obviously, but Heatran's going to be dealt with by PP stalling at this point, not by chipping it into range of an attack. So, that's why I think that. And Gliscor comes in, and Titar is boned, but he's going to keep it for Death Fodder. Good move, because he has a safe switch in Gliscor. And now we're really going to start mowing through these. He makes another nice Earthquake with Reuniclus, or uh, onto Reuniclus, forced it to recover, but he's not able to punish it with Extra Drill like he was before. Because, uh, yeah, because Extra lost its lefties because of the series of mishaps that occurred prior. So he's going to protect on Thunder, waste another Thunder, ABR hits, Gastron gets roared in, Celebi comes in. We're going to speed this up because this has been going on for a while. So Giga Drain, Skarmory, and now, you know, Spikes are up and Extra Drill and Heatran getting Whirlwind around is a lot, lot worse because you can't spin them. Lava Plume, I mean, hoping that Scar... I don't think there was any way ABR was going to risk that there, so I do think that he should have subbed. Uh, just because of... You know, that that would have been the most needless risk ever. And so he could have just subbed, because he needs to take risks at this point anyway. Soulwind, I mean, because he's so far behind. So he had to sub, so Protect. And uh, so Gliscor uses a Stealth Rock on the Protect, nice move. And now he subs on the Gastrodon, finally saying, you know what, that Gliscor is not fast. I gotta take a risk. And now he has his uh, heat trend in on Gastro. So he can roar it out or he can go for a burn. Gastro recovers, plays it safe, and he roars back in Gliscor. So we're seeing how the resilience on both sides leads to often frustrating phasing. You know, with ABR, then you know, half someone's team uh, neutered or uh, really messed with Skarmory before the whole extra to losing its lefties fiasco. But. Uh, and now we, we've got Soulwind uh, with the shoe on the other foot, with Roar constantly bringing in something he doesn't love facing. His only uh, hope is that he can somehow stall Earthquakes, but the thing is he just doesn't have that much PP. He sees he's faster for sure now, and so he can keep subbing and protecting, and uh, Gastron comes back in on a Protect. Switching on Protect, PP stalling Protect, great game for that. So, so uh, Selby comes in, Skarmory comes back in, Excadrill comes back in, gets spun, gets a spin, but he's getting worn down easily now. Can't threaten the Scarm back. Heatran comes in without taking hazard damage at least. but And now he's going to try some hero mode things when he gets up safe for Stealth Rock. So good move from ABR. And now he's going to just keep roaring and going for burns and protect. We just, I mean, look, Heatran's causing a ruckus. but And if, if Soen wasn't on such a timer, then this would have been great. But he was because of the whole Excadrill thing. So... Uh, Gastron is getting ravaged by hazards. T-Tar goes down. Gliscor comes in. So, and there's not much... Uh, you know, someone can't exactly predict so, uh, ABR's protects because, you know, all his moves are important. He can't just use a useless move to burn PP on ABR's protects. So he 
He's uh, stalling out a lot of earthquakes here and eventually gets a sub up on a knockoff. So good move, but at the same time, it's feeling like a day late and a dollar short as he roars out the... We skipped over it, sorry, but Gliscor EQ'd as he trend roared in Reuniclus. So he's going to keep subbing, hope for a thunder miss. Not quite, but even if it did miss, then that wasn't enough. Bringing in Skarm isn't enough. He trend, you know, he can't do it all on its own and... If he hadn't been doing it all on its own, then this would be terrifying for ABR, considering he'd still have the, uh, he'd still have to contend with the extra drill ruining his life and the Celebi and the Skarm. But you know, now he just knows it's a matter of time until he's home free. So, uh, you know, he just doesn't have. He has nine lava plumes. So, uh, sub and roar, and it's just this over and over. And we're going to skip through it as he just see now he's down to eight lava plumes. Gliscor has you know not a ton of PP either, but it just needs to exist uh, just so Heatran doesn't you know do something dumb like uh, break Zamp Sash needlessly. So Gastrodon is also you know hampered by hazards and burned, but it's just still it, it'll outlast the Heatran in conjunction with the Gliscor and Reuniclus. You know, even though that even though ABR's team is so resilient to sand and hazards, this heat train set would have still put in a ton of work, and I'm glad to see how threatening it could be. As here, there we see uh, Thunder break fail to break the sub. I assume it's uh, well. We'll get to that. I think that it's great to see how threatening this set can be, even against a team so resilient to sand and hazards. Uh, of course, as we said, then uh, if he had not been doing this as a last you know, a last Hail Mary long shot to try and win the whole game with Tran, then it would have been incredibly effective. Um, so, yeah. And there we see Thunder not breaking he Tran sub, and I'm assuming that's because he is running the spread. I mean, it's probably bulky no matter what, but even if it's fat, which actually it's faster than Gliscor, it's definitely fast, but no matter what, any sub protect he Tran in black and white is going to have enough special defense to have the sub survive Heatran's vault, or not Heatran's, Rotom Wash's vault switch. So, uh, Zam, you know, it just roars, and he brings in Celebi, and Gliscor come back in, and now there's not much else to say other than we're skipping through this, because Extradrill gets off a spin, and, you know, he can try and crit flinch his way through Skarm, but actually he doesn't try. He goes to Heatran for a free switch, but Heatran just, with three protects, one roar, two lava plumes, and th uh, three subs, it's just not enough. So, he just can't do anything, and we're gonna skip through the rest, because this game ends in a very, very, very long... Oh, we, uh... Wow, that's a Scarf Tar, I think. Good co Nice, nice call on Solwyn's end, because he's pretty well equipped against Zam, which is pretty much the only real reason people use Chop... Well, I guess Thunderous, too. Uh, Agility Thunderous, specifically. Or Switch... Uh, yeah, so... Uh, and, I guess, being more secure against Reading Clips. But overall, Scarf Tar is so much more... So much easier to use. So that's a special offense scarm taking a lot from Stone Edge, and it just barely. I mean, even if he beat the scarm, that wasn't going to be enough. You know, because he's just. Uh, Solon's running on fumes at this point. And now he's going to try and go for the flinch, not getting anything. And Heatran can't do anything. Extradrill can't do anything. These doubles are uh, not getting him anywhere, and ABR doesn't have to predict. It doesn't matter how predictable it is, because he's going to have this game won no matter what. So. Uh, as it looks like Extra is going to do it, but like I said earlier, even if uh, Skarmory went down to uh, Scarf Tar Stone Edge by some miracle, then that wouldn't have been enough to win the game. So here comes the T-Tar, he sacks it, there's an Ice Beam Scarf Tar, good set, for uh, Gliscors and Landos and Garchomps. Anyway, so now we're nearing the end, and reading those Calm Minds, Nasty Plot, so he finally does show Nasty Plot after 283 turns and uh, he doesn't have anything so and that's when he forfeits and the game ends so that was a great game on both ends I already showered both players with praise and we have more games to get to so let's move on from this theme <laughs> we are moving on to DPP so uh, in terms of the series then Solwyn is the most recent DPP Cup winner. He's an excellent player in the tier, and he actually beat ABR in the semis. But why that uh, game was such a blow, especially because Solwyn is famous for winning black and white games that seem lost, and in every single series he plays, be it Smoke and Tour, Smoke and Classic, or you know whatever for SPL, having Solwyn in black and white feels like an automatic win. And since Solwyn has su had such a troubled 
uh, ter- individual tournament final history in the past. You know, when he loses a black and white game, you know, when he's supposed to have that one like securely notched up, then everyone was going, "Oh my God, there's another final loss for Solwyn." And it's hard not to feel that way. I I would think it too. It's like, "Oh my God, he didn't even win black and white, especially when he had it won." Uh oh, this it looks like Solwyn's finals curse is setting in. So. Uh, he's still a great DPP player, though, and I think most people favor... Well, actually, I think it was actually very... This series was as split as you can get in terms of predictions, but he's really going to have to bring it back in uh, Gen 4. Of course, ABR is excellent in the tier as well. Both players are excellent in every tier, pretty much. So, uh, But I would say Solwyn is barely... I personally would favor Solwyn by a margin of 55-45, but I could understand why a lot of players um, would favor ABR slightly. So... Uh, no matter who you give the advantage to in any gen, though, it's going to be slight. But uh, losing black and white was a huge blow. So let's move on to gen 4. So, the leads. Soen leads Flygon, ABR leads Swamper. Flygon lead is Scarf every time. I mean, you can make a case for... Yeah, well, Choice Band technically is a good lead. But uh, Heatran and Metagross run Sash nowadays, so I think that's that's an outdated set from antiquity at least in the lead position cb gone still is good or like you know mix sets or whatever it's basically lead flygon is when you don't have a great lead so you just lead scarf flygon i think heist was the first to do that like 12 years ago uh there go there am I, there i go again with my uh insistence on crediting everything to everyone anyway so swamper uh you know most players who have been around for a while know Swampert as the defensive tank, but nowadays Swampert just keeps getting more and more offensive. While I think the choice band craze died down, everyone's favorite set nowadays is Stealth Rock with a lot of offensive investment and three offensive moves, as opposed to the old standby of Stealth Rock, Earthquake, Ice Beam, and Roar. So sometimes they run Ice Punch and Waterfall, sometimes they run Ice Beam and Hydro Pump uh, to get the jump on Skarmory and Breloom in particular. Either way, it's very safe to assume that it's an offensive Stealth Rock Swamper, usually with lefties. Some players do like Rindo. I know uh, Jimmy Turtwig liked that set. And it's okay. I, I'm not crazy about it, but it's okay. Uh, just Rindo is the Grass Resist Berry, so you can take a Surprise Grass Knot from Infernape or Jirachi or Starmie or Surprise HP Grass from Titar, rare as it may be. Uh, or uh, specifically in the lead position, its most tangible benefit is being able to stay in and get up rocks or earthquake against lead Empoleon, who is a massive, massive, massive threat to traditional Swampert sets. So, um, yeah, so regardless, the not so bold prediction for this first turn is that Solwyn will use U turn and Swampert will get up Stealth Rock, as it is not threatened by Flygon at all. So, uh, Solwyn U turns, brings in Roserade, ABR gets up rocks. So, Roserade, mid-game Rose, is either a specially defensive Spiker, Spikes, and uh, then you can run T-Spikes, Energy Ball or Grass Knot. Energy Ball is usually worse, but Grass Knot doesn't break Rotom Appliance's subs. HP Fire is good coverage. Some people run Sleep Talk because Breloom's a pain in the ass. You can run Stun Spore, you can run Rest with Natural Cure, although that I don't think is being run anymore at all, because everyone likes Poison Point Roserade now, so it can actually absorb Breloom's Spore. So, uh, either way, it's either that specially defensive spiking set, or double spiking set, or a fast sleep powder T-spike set. Like the lead set with Focus Ash, just with Black Sludge instead of Focus Ash, because it's mid-game, and Roserade has great defensive utility, because it's bulky and has some good resist, and it's fast. So it handles things like offensive Suicune and waters in general really well. So, uh, we see... 13% from the Flygon U-turn against Swampert, and because I am obnoxiously thorough, then we are going to calc and find out if we can gauge anything from that. We assume Jolly Scarf Flygon, because you have to assume that. I personally love Adamant uh, Scarf Flygon, but I recognize that Jolly is the standard. So U-turn against... So the Swampert has more bulk than just 0 HP, because it did... Uh, Whoops, that's the black and white game. It did 13%, right? So it did. Uh, so against the fully offensive Swamper set being max HP, max uh, attack, which some people run, it, it is not this. So uh, conversely, though, it is probably not going to be um, max defense. I mean, it could be, but it just seems more like the Swamper would run some amount of bulk. How? Because uh, the spread I tend to run, and I tell other people to run, other people, other people to run is 252 HP 108 defense because that lives a CB Knight outrage after rocks. So 
uh, at least that much, and he's doing 13%, so maybe he has, you know, a lot more. Maybe it is just a defensive Swamper, because this is a lot of investment. At, and at this point, you're not really running an offensive Swampert anymore. Um, so, especially because I think offensive Swampert wants a little special offense investment, maybe a little speed for Clefable, but a little special offense investment to go mono a mono with Starmie. So, we don't know, and uh, what we can say is that this Flygon is almost certainly not adamant. So, and the Swampert is packing some serious bulk. So, Roserade comes in, and with its next move, we will r see if it is a fast T-spiking set, or a specially defensive spiker, because the fast T-spiking set would prioritize, uh, if not Sleep Powder, then T-spikes, although Sleep Powder is very likely, and the spiking set will go for spikes. And since ABR, some players like to be cheeky with their Swampert and Earthquake, a, a Spikes raid they know is Spikes, because Spikes and Sleep Powder are illegal in DPP together. Incidentally, so is Spikes and Leaf Storm, but that's not relevant. But they know that Spikes raid is going to go for Spikes every single time. But uh, when you don't know the Rose raid set, and it very feasibly could be offensive T-Spikes as well, then you don't want to keep your Swampert in, because even if you don't get hit with a grass move, you're getting slept, and people need to use their Swampert defensively, so it is not an ideal candidate to uh, do that. So, and we don't know, because Spikes raid... And a fast offensive T spikes raid are both piece perfectly feasible with Scarf Flygon. I mean, if we were going back in time a little, I would say that Spikes raid is more common with Scarf Flygon because it softens things up more quickly for a late game Scarf Flygon stab cleanup with Earthquake or Outrage. But it's also very feasible that it's a T spikes offense team with uh, uh, with a fast T spiking sleeping Roserade and a Scarf Flygon as the speed. Uh, source of speed, th uh, threat checking, and cleanup. So, ABR's not going to take that risk. He goes to Latios, and Roserade goes for Toxic Spikes. Now, if it is a double spiking Roserade, then that is unorthodox, but it could mean that he's got a sweeper. As a matter of fact, I'm almost certain it does mean that he's got a sweeper that really appreciates uh, having things poisoned above all else. Because Spikes is just good damage on everything, but having something poisoned on entry is really backbreaking. Uh, an ancient example is uh, Philip 7086's Torment Heatran team that showed Torment Tran to the masses is incredibly weak to, on paper, it's incredibly weak to CB Tar spamming Stone Edge because there's no rock resist. However, if you get T Spikes down with Fortress first, then Heatran is able to stall it out with Substitute and, I mean, technically you can PP stall it anyway, but it's able to stall it out with uh, Substitute and Protect a lot more easily. So, uh, that's, your, that's the general idea, that T-Spikes stick, you know, spikes are immediate damage, but if a Pokemon is staying in, then it doesn't do... Uh, if a Pokemon is staying in, then it doesn't keep going, whereas Poison does. So this is uh, common on special offense teams with th something like Sub Call Mind Jirachi, which prefers... Um, which prefers... Uh, T-Tar poisoned to just taking spikes, so it can set up and, you know, keep subbing until t is in range of an attack. Uh, so Torment Tran's another great example, uh, and sub and Calm Mind Jirachi, of course, and you know we could uh, other things like Subatai and Polion and um, Subatai and Polion, uh, Calm Mind Protect Raikou because I think Protect Calm Mind Raikou is more common and better than the old Sub Calm Mind set, and uh, you know general special offense stuff like Gengar as well. You know, get, uh, getting a T spike down helps Gengar really mess with Swampert one on one, uh, even more than it already does. And even if it's not a specially defensive spi double spiking set, because there's no such thing as specially defensive pure toxic spikes, unless you also have a Skarmory on the team, because there's no reason to pass up on spikes when you could easily throw it on. So if you have Skarmory, then you have spikes elsewhere, so you don't need to use it, and you can use a specially defensive dedicated toxic spiker. But if you don't, then you don't. So you just use double spikes. So he could be a specially defensive double spiker, uh, prioritizing the T spikes. He could be a specially defensive pure toxic spiker, not uh, with a Skarmory in the back for spikes, which is also very feasible on uh, Scarf Flygon cleanup kind of semi stall teams. Although they were a lot more popular pre Clefable, <laughs> but uh, point stands. And it could still be a fast offensive T spiking set. So. From th uh, from this, we have gleaned a couple things. If it is a specially defensive or fast um, sleep powder T spike set, because you can't use, use sleep powder and spikes again, then he 
and he also might have not wanted to sleep powder into a sleep talking resist uh like uh sleep talk choice specs latias or sleep talk choice band dragonite those are the two big ones or like cb gara i suppose as well but I think the likelier thing that we can suss out with more confidence is that he prioritizes the T-Spikes above all else because he's got a sweeper that uh, he's got a sweeper that abuses the T-Spikes uh, more so than anything else, and it can really break it, like those Heatran and Jirachi examples. So he gets that. Latias is not really a threat to specially defensive Roserade, so we'll see what kind of set it is. And ABR reveals himself to be a support Latias set, not a Specs variant. So, whoops, let me. So, um, Solwyn, Solwyn goes in, goes for Spike, staying in, knowing he can take a Specs Draco Meteor, and he will get a Spike out of it. So he's got two hazard, two big hazards very early. Uh, two layer, one layer of T-Spikes is generally safe for early game because it's A, it's more immediate damage, and B, you don't know if they have a T-Spike absorber yet, or even how effective it's going to be, so you may as well take the guaranteed damage, um, on as much as possible with the second spike. It's generally safer. So, uh, he rev so now we see that it is a, uh, especially defensive double spiking raid, and that the ABR is running a support T-Wave Latia set, so that suggests some sort of big hitter in the back. Uh, DPP is all about figuring out as much as you can about the opposing team uh, with the little information that you have early in the game. So as you can see here, we have two Pokemon revealed on both sides and a couple moves. But from that, and uh, from that, then we have been able to suss out quite a lot. Uh, so. Anyway, so now Roserade is not threatened by a defensive Latias at all. You can just keep stacking hazards to the ceiling. And of course, I'm sure that uh, another thing we can suss out is because Solwind is in tune with the metagame. He has a hazard stacking team, but he is going to be prepared for Clefable in some way. Because Clefable doesn't care if you have max hazards on your side. It switches in effortlessly. So, uh, that's something else to consider. And now we don't know if someone's going to keep going for the hazards, and he does. He gets the second layer of spikes, and I'm sure he's going to go for the third, but he doesn't. He goes to Heatran. I thought that was odd, because I get wanting to preserve Roserade's health, but as we see here from the Switch, it's Poison Point, not Natural Cure. So I get that, but at the same time, uh, just like in the Black and White game, if you're getting two spikes and you have the opportunity for a third, I think you got to take it every time. It's such a massive difference. I'm not saying two spikes is bad, but if you can get the third, you absolutely should. And since Roserade is now going to be, you know, 80, you know, l let's say, uh, oh, sorry, 74 and paralyzed after Stealth Rock and Leftovers, assu or Black Sludge, rather, assuming Sandstorm doesn't come into play. And... Uh, I don't think the extra Dragon Pulse would have made it suddenly unable to deal with something it would have been able to deal with otherwise. Because when it's paired and at that HP, it doesn't like switching into Roserade anymore. Or, uh, into Swampert anymore. So I think, uh, someone should have just taken the third spike. And, uh, Avery is just trying to chip it down. Uh, I know the feeling very well of being helpless against the Spike's Roserade, because it's not the most prominent Spike, or the metagame is very geared towards Skarmory, and sometimes Roserade comes out of nowhere and just knocks you on your ass with how, um, knocks you on your ass with how it mauls common responses to Skarmory, like Waters and Magnezone. So, a uh, great call from Solwyn to use it there, especially because it comes with the benefit of double spiking, so he doesn't have to waste a slot on Nidoqueen. Uh, if he wants T-Spikes, which he very clearly does. So Heatran coming in here, taking little from lefties. Now, you could say, oh, it's a, it's a Torment Tran. It's a, it's a, some sort of T-Spikes abuser. But we're going to see it's Rocks. Well, we're not going to see on this turn because it pairs in full pairs. But it is Rocks as he gets them as Swampert comes back in. And... Um, so he gets the rocks up, and so it's a specially defensive Heatran, which partners with Roserade and gets the hazards up. So the abusers are coming elsewhere. Of course, Heatran is naturally annoying with T-Spikes, because Waters and T-Tar hate T-Spikes. So as you can see right here. So now, of course, he's got to switch into the Swampert, which is still annoying because his Roserade is paralyzed. So um, how is he going to do that? Who knows? And now someone shows Suicune. So he comes in on an Ice Beam, which is a lot nicer than coming in on a Earthquake, of course. And uh, ABR was going for Ice Beam, which is a heads-up move in case a uh, Solwyn tried to... In, in case Solwyn felt... Uh, this is very feasible, I think. 
if he felt, oh, well, now that my Roserade's paralyzed, I can't really switch around the Swampert too well, but he, and he's got an Earthquake as it does more to Roserade. Earthquake far out damages Ice Beam against Roserade with Swampert's high attack and Roserade's low defense in comparison to Swampert's low special attack and Roserade's high special defense. And he uh, very feasibly could have gone to Flygon to dodge... It would have been risky, but he could have gone to Flygon, dodge the Earthquake, U-turn for more chip, and dance around... Swampert a lot more feasibly, so that was a heads-up move on Solwyn's and ABR's end. So, Suicune comes in, and now we see the special attacker that abuses hazards. It's a classic DPP combo, and he's likely to have more. He's going to have a Ghost and then some sort of uh, Team Glue or some sort of Finisher. So, well, he's got Team Glue and Flygon, but uh, ways of dealing with Hazard, or er, not Hazards, but Clefable and furthering uh, his... Hazard strategy and whatnot. You know, other ways of dealing with Starmie other than tacking on a ghost. So, uh, Suicune comes in, it's a massive threat, and in comes Breloom. So, Breloom is dangerous because. Or in, a bra dangerous answer to Suicune. Uh, now, while Breloom does enjoy T Spikes being down because it doesn't have to wait for its Toxic Orb to be activated and thus immediately heals. Uh, let's see if we can suss anything out from that Swampert Ice Beam about Suicune's spread, because. Uh, Let's just use the physically offensive Stealth Rock, and we'll just use Ice Beam with a uh, Brave Nature against Suicune, because could we suss out what kind of Suicune is? Because against 0 HP, it's 7%, and against max HP, it's also 7%. Uh, the Ice Beam, and from how much bulk we know the Swampert has, then it is very you know, unlikely that he's, you know, packing the bulk in. So basically, uh, I, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference, but the important part here is that we don't know if the Suicune is, you know, mono attacking, so Crocoon, Calm Mind, Rest, Sleep, Talk, Surf, or if it's offensive, uh, Calm Mind, Surfer, Hydro, Ice Beam, HP Electric, or Protect, both very, very feasible on T-Spikes teams. Uh, both are classics of the T-Spikes offense, or semi-stall offense, whatever genre balance if you want to call it that and so Breloom is good against mono attacking Suicune but against offensive Suicune it just drops you know the best it can do is in a one-on-one -on -one, it can live an ice beam from full health if it's a bulky loom but it's definitely not a switch in especially not with hazards up so uh, ABR plays it s well no ABR plays it uh safe uh it makes a great move while Solwind reveals that he is not ice beam because there's not much to be gained from hiding you have ice beam I don't think and we can see that uh, Solwyn, uh, Suicune is a massive threat to ABR's team because this Latias set, T-Wave, Dragon Pulse, Recover, and then usually Reflect in the last slot, although Toxic is also feasible. Uh, then, you know, it's not very good against Suicune, and ABR doesn't look to have, like, a Clefable or something that can handle it more reliably. So, uh, Suicune is posing a massive threat. So, ABR makes a good move. He goes to his Jirachi on an Ice Beam. So, if Suicune reveals Ice Beam, it is specially... It is a full offensive Suicune. And if this is a bulky Jirachi, you know, it's... Without Sand, he's not going to be able to flinch the Suicune out, but he can paralyze it. He's got a real pair of focus, so there's definitely going to be a big hitter like a CB Tar or something irritating like Machamp back here. Although, the odds of Machamp drops significantly alongside Breloom. They're hard to pair together, because... They uh, they cover some things, but not a lot of things, and there are a lot of things to cover. So, uh, but, you know, that, it's not a perfect answer, but it would have been some sort of answer to uh, an Ice Beaming Suicune, because Sub I Ice Beam Suicune is incredibly rare in DPP because of, um, because of the presence of Sand. So, uh, yeah, so ABR, or so Solon reveals that he is not Ice Beam, and he goes to Roserade to handle Breloom. Uh, which is nice because it's already paired, so it can't be spored, and Breloom's already chipped, so that's nice. And, uh, you know, I said earlier he should have gotten the third layer of spikes, and I still think it would have been okay, but keeping his Roserade healthy for Breloom wound up being a good choice. So I think it could have gone either way, because I think he's not going to have a slow team, he's going to have a fast team that can dance around Breloom, but, uh, you know, there was merit to keeping Roserade healthy, and uh, I overlooked that, and he kept it in mind, so... Big props to Solwyn, although I still think a third layer of Spikes would have been really nasty. But, you no, know, props to him for playing it his way. I think it could go either way, but I... You know, his way was working out better in this game, as you see there. So, uh, especially, I admire the foresight he had, because the 
focus on para or the focus on this bulky offense with para w between Swabert and Latias makes me think of champ more than Breloom, but it worked out. So um Heatran comes in on Jirachi risklessly, that's fine. And what's nice is that because of the hazards ABR got or uh, Solwyn got, then Solwyn or Solwyn, then ABR is not as keen to double switch around against the Heatran. Matter of fact, he needs the Jirachi so much that, you know, while it's still not a good sw uh, switch to Suicune, uh, it can barely check it, but it really doesn't like taking entry hazards. So uh, he is kind of forced to stay in just to gain more lefties, and he doesn't want to switch because that's just going to be more, more hazard pain. And oh, he doesn't definitely doesn't want to switch into this Heatran, so he's kind of a damned if you do in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. So Solwyn's team is looking really threatening. So here comes the Latias, uh, not really threatening the Heatran, and almost certainly going to get status by Lava Plume. Now, the standard on Specially Defensive Heatran is Stealth Rock, Lava Plume, Protect always. And then for the last slot, you can run Roar. That's traditionally the standard for Stealth Rocking Spadef Heatran. You can run Toxic if you like. But a set that Heist started using, and then a couple other guys, like ABR, started using is Specially Defensive with Explosion, which is an awesome set. And if I had to place a bet just on what's currently popular in the metagame, then I think that Heatran set is almost certainly what's being used here. Because like we said earlier, entry hazard teams really gotta uh, deal with Clefable. And nothing really switches into Heatran with a bunch of hazards up safely besides Clefable. Uh, especially Spadef Heatran with hazards up is incredibly annoying. You know, an offensive set can be dealt with by something like Tyranitar or Latias like you see here. But uh, you know, they're going to get ransacked by a special defensive set, which sticks around and just statuses them all the time. So, the idea is that Spadef Heatran lures in Clefable and then booms on it. A defensive Pokemon with boom is not as much of a contradiction as you might think, because it's still going to be a great defensive Pokemon, in, but it just has another weapon at its disposal. So, I think it's really great. It's a really great set, and I think it's a, fan it's a fantastic choice on Solwyn's team. So, uh, right now... Solwind is, as I've been talking, then uh, Solwind has been in the process of burning the Latias and, you know, making waste PP and wearing it down. Tries to get Roserade in on a recover, but ABR goes for a D-Pulse, nice foresight, and, or just maybe not wanting to waste recovers prematurely. I think that was more the case uh, because he doesn't have to recover till he's at very low HP, so why waste one when you're at higher HP? Uh, not that it's making much of a difference. He's pretty much locked in a PP stall against Heatran. He gets the benefit of not letting Roserade in for spikes uh, for free and gets to hit it with two D-Pulse instead of one. And that means Solwyn is more vulnerable to a crit or a pair, but he doesn't get it and he gets that third layer. He decides, you know what, it's worth it. Breloom is already chipped, so I can get that third layer. Matter of fact, if my Suic if his Suicune's a mono attacker, then I would say that the third layer is going to be more of a weapon in fighting Breloom than Roserade's health at this point. Uh, since it switched in earlier and took 6% uh, from Stealth Rock, which does add up. Every percent is important when dealing with an offensive behemoth like Breloom. Unless it's a defensive set, but still. That third layer is going to really put Breloom in range for anything, even just a mono-attacking Suicune. So, and now he just goes back to uh, Heatran. Uh, good moves on both sides, recovering, knowing that he's going to switch. And that he can't really hurt it anyway. And now they're just... Uh, Solwyn saving a sack. This is a big thing I see inexperienced players do sometimes. Uh, because the Pokemon's at low health, they just let it go. But like we saw in the black and white game when ABR's T-Tar was at low health and he preserved it. And here when Solwyn's uh, Roserade is at full low health and preserved it. Obviously, if you can't switch into another Pokemon, then it's better to... Safely. Then it's better to let your low HP Pokemon go than to uh, risk your higher HP Pokemon, but if you can switch into the poke if you can switch into the opposing Pokemon safely, then yeah, why wouldn't you? Just uh, you have Death Fodder later. That's huge. Death Fodder wins games. So anyway, uh, you know, this is a long PP battle, so we're gonna fast forward through it a little bit, because there's not too much to say here, other than you can do the math, you can count, because he's also got protect as PP and uh, but Latias, Latias doesn't have infinite recovers, so I personally thought that Solon was just going to take the plunge, especially because he's full parrot, and full parrot actually works in his favor here because it means he burns less PP because he's going to full parrot once in a while. So, of course, uh, T-Wave has a lot of PP, and so does Reflect, so it is a stall war, and, but I, since the Latias isn't really threatening, he can just park his Heatran in front of it. So he's got a lot of PP with Stealth Rock, Lava Plume, not a lot of Lava Plumes, honestly. And he's going to burn through Stealth Rock and protect pretty quickly if he's not attacking. 
uh, and you know that means Latias burns left less uh, recovers as well because he only has to recover over he only has to recover burn damage which is six percent at a time because there's no sand and he's got leftovers so a uh, lot of low PP going on. And, of course, we mentioned that Heatran has Explosion, but it's tough to time it because Latias is faster and has Reflect. So, the ideal scenario is exactly there, where Latias was at half HP, and so we're going to time it once again. So, uh, Latias was at half HP and Reflect wore off. So, even if Latias throws up a Reflect here, it's going to be... It's going to take a ton. It's going to be left at very low health, so Scarf Flygon just comes in and U-turns. And if he recovers, then he uh, comes in and... If he recovers, then uh, Explosion is going to bring it down to low health, and the same thing happens. So no matter what, Reflect or U-turn... Or Reflect or Recover, then Heatran's Boom is going to bring Latias down here. So that was beautifully timed, and it's not like ABR could exactly switch around the Heatran. I mean, given how much the Heatran threatened the rest of his team, uh, in terms of being able to switch in and just constantly blanking Jirachi like nothing else. This actually ABR probably saw this as a positive, honestly, because suddenly his uh, ABR's uh, Solwyn's answer to uh, his Jirachi, his hard counter, is suddenly gone. Of course, if it's a Crocoon, Rest Sleep Talk, then that's just as almost as much of a hard counter, but you know, at least it's something. And if it's some sort of offensive Suicune that he just wanted to preserve the health, I don't know. If then if he just wanted to preserve his offensive Suicune's health by not ice beaming the Breelum, I don't know. I don't think that makes much sense. But he, he probably didn't see it as too bad that his Latias, which was probably not doing a ton, uh, was traded for the Heatran, which is incredibly annoying. Uh, since, you know, this Latias set is not going to do much more than T Wave the Suicune, and we don't think that's going to be a problem because it has Rest Talk. Or so we assume, because it's a mono attacker. Because uh, if it's rest talk, then you know it's so not too big a deal. So, but speaking of para not being too big a deal against a rest talk Suicune, then you know he doesn't have much choice but to para it with Jirachi and then sack Latias and try to do a lot of damage with Breelum or something. In fairness, if he can pull that off, you know he's going to rely on bad sleep talk, several bad sleep talks from uh, Suicune if it's a slower Breloom, which I assume it is, so he has max HP and max power with all the para running around. Speed EVs seem superfluous. So Suicune's going to be faster, so, and it's bulky, and it takes a couple seed bombs, so he can definitely... Matter of fact, I don't even know if that would be enough. Because he can take two seed bombs and then eventually surf, but then it would be get revenge by something faster, but he would still leave a huge chunk in ABR's already crippled team. So... Uh... But it's something, you know, he, he's got to play for something. He's got to paralyze it and go from there with Breloom or whatever his other unrevealed Pokemon are. Like uh, CB Tar, you know, cut off the lefties, do a ton of damage to it even though it's bold. And rely on Sleep Talk stuff. So Suicune is posing a massive threat because we're assuming Mono Attacker with Crow, which is great. But suddenly its leftovers go first and it's faster than Jirachi. And that's weird because offensive Suicune is faster than specially defensive Jirachi. But Crocoon... I mean, there are some modest Crocoon sets out there, but they're definitely not going to be faster than a specially defensive Jirachi, which is the only Jirachi that would ever be slower than some form of Suicune. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, I guess you could make a case for some mid-280s uh, Jirachi being slower than a Max Timid Suicune, but a Max Timid Suicune would have had Ice Beam. Almost certainly, anyway. Uh, depending on if it's another set. Oh no, am I hinting at something? But... Uh, yeah, point being that the Suicune is faster, so that means something's up, but, you know, most fast Suicunes, actually that ties into the point, most fast Suicunes are offensive with Ice Beam, so what gives? And the Suicune pulls out a substitute, and it, the Body Slam does not break it, so Subcom Mine Suicune, well, Subcom Mine Suicune runs Ice Beam, so why wouldn't he just Ice Beam the Breloom, especially because we know he's so fast and didn't have to fear Breloom being faster. You can't tell from Leftovers versus Poison Heal, because Lefties always goes first and Poison Heal always goes second, so it's not an indicator of a faster or slower Pokemon. So now he's just going to call Mine to his heart's content, and, you know, he's definitely going to dominate the hell out of Jirachi. So, uh, he's just gotta, he's gotta go to Magnazone, which is interesting, because we don't know what Magnazone said it is. We see it doesn't have leftovers, which I think most Magnazone should be leftovers just because it helps it d handle, uh, Jirachi better. But if you think you can handle Jirachi, like with this team, you've got Wish Jirachi and, um, well, I assume it's a Wish Jirachi because it's slow and has Iron Head Protect and Body Slam, so there's no way it's a U-turn or something. And he's got a Swampert, so... 
And I guess Latias is going to be T-waving Jirachi a lot of the time, so this is a team where I think it's okay for non-scarfs, for non-lefty zone. So is it the old set of Custap? Somehow I don't see that. Uh, Scarf T-Wave has been picking up some notoriety in recent months, uh, just because it's Scarf Zone is generally pretty good. You know, I, I don't think it's amazing, but it has a lot of it has some good utility because it suddenly outspeeds everything besides Starmie, and uh, and that can be pretty nice against offense as long as you're not trying to one v one a B slamming Jirachi with it. And on this team of ABRs, you won't have to, which is kind of the point. So. Uh, it's very, I think, based on trends and you know the lack of speed elsewhere, and then Scarf Magnazone is definitely the likeliest, especially because he's got a very T-Wave heavy focus on this team, and uh, Scarf Magnazone curly, currently trendily runs T-Wave. So, uh, T-Bolt, HP, Fire, usually, uh, and then Explosion, Flash Cannon, and T-Wave, you know, two of those three. So, I think most people generally drop Flash Cannon. It's not too useful. So, uh, Suicune subs. So, this is a fast Suicune. So, the only way Magnazone is uh, handling this encounter is if it Custap endures, in which case Suicune just subs again, so nothing was done. Or uh, if he's Scarf, in which case he can handle... In case he, which case he can outspeed and uh, T-Bolt Suicune sub. But he's... Uh, let's check out some damage calcs against Scarf Magnazone, uh, especially because Scarf Magnazone tends to be naive, not even timid, because it doesn't want to cut into Explosion's power, and its attack size is already pretty low. So, see, plus one Surf is doing... Uh, if it's zero special attack, it definitely has a chance to KO. So, he might be getting out of this one. Um, barely, but the Suicune can come back in against the Jirachi later, which is the problem. However, it will have been chipped significantly. So that is half the battle against Suicune sometimes. That said, since it, Latias is dead and it out, uh, Breloom is going to lose to it and Swampert is going to lose to it and Magnazone is going to die to hazards and it sets up all over Jirachi, it being chipped might not matter. So, uh, and suddenly Solon reveals the moneymaker Protect. Now, those of you who have played Oris or parts of Sun and Moon might recognize uh, this set as the legendary Vincoon. Uh, you know, there's no Scald in this generation, but... And I said earlier, Sub Suicune is rare without... Uh, because it gets messed up by Sand so badly. That is true. However, players more experimental and, you know, let's just say it, brave than I have been messing with Rain Dance teams that seek to unleash the full potential of Substitute Suicune. Uh, because it is really nasty because it's got 101 subs and it would completely dominate most Clefable sets if it didn't get worn down by uh, having to sub and not being able to heal in sand. So it is almost certain that someone's got a Rain Dancer somewhere on his team. Or, you know, Sunny Day or you know, whatever. But uh, that's, that, that's almost certain. And he's using Substitute, Rain, uh, Substitute Protect Suicune to full effect because of it, which is a massive, massively annoying threat in... Uh, if you can remove sand at all reliably. Uh, so, there's that. It's also a massively annoying threat in advance if you can remove sand reliably. Uh, so, you know, who knows if he has a Doug Trio and then the weather change or something. Wouldn't be surprising. And actually, uh, in the semifinals of this classic, then Tricking used this same exact Suicune on a, on a dedicated rain team against ABR, and it was really threatening, so... I think that's where someone got the idea. Anyway, so he does reveal himself to be a Scarf Magnazone, and Surf takes him out. So either he got a high roll against Naive Zone, uh, since this is the calc, so he was at 70%. Because uh, it's you're not going to run Timid, uh, Timid Explosion Zone, I promise you. It's just not worth it. So, uh, Surf from 70% has a 18, call it 19% chance to KO, you know, with crits and whatnot. Who knows if he has special attack investment, so. And against a timid zone, it never would have killed, so it absolutely was naive. So, uh, yeah, it goes down, and protect is nice, not just because it's incredibly annoying with pressure and sub, but because it uh, 
keep Suicune healthy. Like earlier, I said, you know, maybe he can get around it because Suicune will be chipped you know, with its own sub, and you know, it'll take rocks again later, so it can be dealt with somehow. Even though we then went on to say that Suicune would still be a massive threat because Latias is dead, and Breloom and Swampert get destroyed, and Jirachi is setup fodder. But at, even so, even at low health or lower health, then the general idea stands because, you know, one of Suicune's biggest problems is getting worn down. So, uh, that is what Protect bypasses it. And matter of fact, in the past, then some players have used Offensive Suicune with Protect uh, in a similar vein. Instead of, I mean, it doesn't handle Seismic Tossers like Blissey and Clefable and Body Slam Jirachi, but against Offensive stuff, it's really nice, especially if you clear weather. I mean, even in Sand, it's nice because you rack up Toxic Spikes and Sand on the opponent. So, against an uh, annoying Pokemon like Shaman, which was for, or Zapdos, well Zapdos has lefties, but Shaman definitely with T-Spikes, uh, who was uh, for a long time one of Suicune's most prominent nemeses. So uh, that was uh, the idea, and outside of Sand you get some nice recovery so you don't instantly get put into Scarf Flygon range, for example. So uh, ABR shows his last Machamp, so uh, it is a massive threat alongside all the paralysis he has, at least two, and I'm gonna guess three. And he does have the double fighting core, and he does have the defenses to uh, back up the weaknesses. He has the defensive core to back up the weaknesses that the double fighting core brings, so, you know, I like it. But uh, it doesn't have Lumberry, so that's already bad news, because even if it's a Rest Talk Machamp, then it's still not favored to handle the Suicune one-on-one, -on -one, because Suicune's going to protect for completely free and then sub and... Oh, it also has pressure for Dynamic Punch PP if it really wants to um, play it safe, but he's not going to have to bother that, bother with that, because he's just going to sub a couple times, and uh, sub and protect a couple times with nothing Machamp can do. Even if it rest talk, then it would still not be favored. I mean, it would be an interesting dynamic, but Suicune could just go for Surf and, you know, pressure it, rather than play, because uh, Payback probably breaks a sub. Uh, we can check, because I love being thorough. Uh, he, he, oh, wow. Oh, this because this one is faster. It doesn't do double. Yeah, see, Payback breaks a sub. Um, yeah, you have to mess with the speed stat in the calc to get those kinds of accurate calcs. Anyway, so even if you rest talk, that was still not... It was hope, but it wasn't much. And he decides to preserve his Suicune's health, and he does the calc, I'm sure, and finishes the Machamp off. Since so plus one Surf against max HP Machamp does... Actually, I'm going to assume he had some sort of... A special attack investment because otherwise that was a needless risk because against max HP Machamp let's just even be generous and not give it four special offense it can come up short and that would have been a huge waste that said ABR's team is so crippled I'm pretty sure that Flygon was going to just win anyway so you know can be forgiven but uh, you know I don't think another round of sub and or actually even protect there honestly would have been fine especially because the Machamp is leftovers it doesn't have um it doesn't have uh, Custat Berry. Oh, but I just saw that Dynamic Punch was stalled out, so he didn't have to risk it. So, yeah, see, Dynamic Punch, here's two, and there's the last D Punch on the sub, so he could uh, he could uh, sub, he could surf safely. I still would have protected just because I'm that kind of guy, but, you know, it's fine. And uh, so it was unnecessary, who knows. But, yeah, so now uh, Suicune's just going to cleanly sweep. So we don't know what Solwyn's lasts are. But, uh, I, I've heard of what they were, but I would prefer to let him speak for himself, because I'm trying to get him for an interview on the channel. Uh, so, yeah, I, I really like his team, though. I really, I really do. And I like ABR as well. It's very dedicated to its synergy. But this was a great call from Solon. Really heads up. Really, uh, ahead of the curve. Alright, so the score is 1-1, and we're moving to advance. So, Solon took DPP. Which I said, I guess if you a averaged out all the predictions, you would say it was like 51.49 or something. Or even less, 50.5 versus 49.5. Uh, those are my very precise, calculated mathematical pr um, mathematics. Whatever. I've been yammering for an hour 38 straight, and we still have at least two more games to go. Hell yeah, for those of you who are not familiar with the series yet and don't want to be spoiled. Alright, so advanced. So, I think it was pretty clear that ABR was favored in this one. So, uh, and Solon has 
shown flashes of brilliance in the tier in the past. Matter of fact, he made his Smogan Tour Finals when uh, Advance was in it. And But uh, he's also shown some struggling with the tier in the past, whereas ABR has generally been quite consistent. So we are going to finally turn off the Suicune theme. It served us well, and we're going to move on to the Gen 3 Champion remix theme. Also, these are all remixes, so, you know, copyright and whatnot. Anyway, so, here's a classic advanced lead matchup. Zapdos versus Tyranitar. So much of this depends on the sets and the strategy of the team, but in general, if you're a physical attacking... If you're a Tar, you generally stay in on Zapdos. If you're a physical attacking Tar, you just, you know, rock slide and threaten it out. You can focus punch. Uh, that's been done and is really nice because BP Zapdos with Gengar is fairly rare, so you're going to be smacking Swampert or Metagross pretty nicely. And... Um, on ladder, it's likelier that sometimes an offensive Zapdos will T-bolt you just just to do it. Even without like a Doug Trio backup or something, just in case they think they know your team or they think they know that you're in, they, in case they think they know you're gonna predict or something like that. But for the most part, to keep it simple, so we're not here even longer than we already are, then physical as T-Tar will stay in pretty much every single time. I mean, look, if you have a T-Tar and you have to run from Zapdos, then why are you even leading T-Tar? I mean, Sand is big, but when you take that one lead matchup that is universally supposed to be good for you, then you are... Uh, then... You know, what's? I don't think it's the point. At that point, I would rather just lead Skarmory or something. If you have one, of course, or just anything else. So, uh, T-Tar gets the Sand, but it also handles Zapdos. And conversely, Zapdos is not threaten. It threatens every lead besides uh, T-Tar. So, that's what makes it such a classic dynamic to start off the game. So, Zapdos, you know, offensive usually will BP, just to play it safe. We're not in the latter environment where you can just get another game if it doesn't go your way. And uh, so even a special tar will stay in and just, you know, crunch uh, Zapdos uh, before the set is revealed. An offensive, pure mix set, the UD tar, will just go for an Ice Beam because it also prevents Breloom from switching in safely. And a physical set will just Focus Punch or Rock Slide, uh, be it uh, physical with lefties or Choice Band. So, and uh, the very, very rare DD tar might go for a DD, put some pressure on the opponent right from the beginning of the game, especially because uh, offensive teams with Swampert and Metagross tend to be frailer, they tend to not always kill T-Tar back, although, you know, it depends on the T-Tar spread, but, so we don't complicate things. Zapdos will generally run away if it's an offensive set, and the only time in a high-stakes tournament match like this that you will expect to see that it uh, will stay in is if it's trying to die to the T-Tar. I mean, not that you want your Zapdos to die, but because then the Dugtrio will come in, and that automatically means the weather is getting cleared. That is the only scenario in which case it is consistently worth it to stay in on a T-Tar uh, with a Zapdos lead, because that has the most tangible benefit. I mean, you can, you know, remove Dugtrio, remove it with a Dugtrio, and, you know, 5-5, five, five, and I got rid of the T-Tar. Yeah, but you also lost your Zapdos, so what is the tangible reward you're getting from that that made it worth throwing away a top 5 Pokemon in the tier? So, uh, Zapdos, T-Bolt, doesn't do a lot of damage, gets a para, and gets dropped by Rock Slide, and in comes Dugtrio to finish off the Tar. So, what we saw from that, that we don't know the T-Tar set, although we can assume Choice Band, because uh, four attacks would have leftovers, and, uh, you know, we can just calc. I th think that Spadef Zapdos does a little bit less to... Uh, would have done a little bit less if it was a bulky Tar, and CB t generally runs max special attack and or max attack and max HP these days. So uh, how much did it do? It did 38. Yeah, so that seems about right. Whereas versus, uh, yeah, okay. So it was not max HP tar. So uh, very. So I think with the damage it did and the lack of lefties and the rock slide, the immediate rock slide, then I think it was definitely a banded tar. So, and then Dugshow comes in, so we know Soulwind is clearing the weather, and the Pokemon that abuse weather clearing the most in advance are Snorlax and Suicune. Uh, those Pokemon are so nasty without sand that people are willing to go out of their way to, you know, do what you just saw on the screen uh, to facilitate a sandless environment for them. And matter of fact, no other Pokemon are impacted as negatively by the presence of sand, so... 
ABR does not respond with Skarmory, which means it is almost certain he does not have one. You know, even if he thought, oh, there's a, someone's running some sort of uh, Magneton Claydol team, then even if he thought that was the case, he, it was probably better to just go to Skarmory and force in the Magneton and try to respond that way, because Dugcho has to switch out. So uh, you can get a double switch to your own Doug if you're feeling frisky. So Zapdos means almost surely no Skarm. And uh, Solon goes to Snorlax, so uh, Zapdos, so Aviar goes for a BP, I think, while there is the possibility of Salaby and whatnot, uh, I think that generally Zapdos is one of the few things that threatens Magdal teams just in sand, because it, um... Because, like we said, Snorlax really hates sand, and the biggest example of that is when it has to switch into Zapdos, as it is often, ta it, pretty much always tasked with uh, doing. If you have a Snorlax on your team, it's pretty much always your Zapdos switch, with some rare exceptions. But, uh, so I think Avir could have tried to get some use out of that, as opposed to, you know, pummeling the Snorlax... You know, because if Solwyn tries to pivot the T-Bolt with a Claydol or something, Claydol's not a threat. Whereas Snorlax tends to be a threat when your CB Tar gets uh, dugged like that so quickly. So, uh, Snorlax really hates taking T-Bolts in sand, even if it's bulky, because Zapdos is just so strong. Even bulky Lax versus bulky Zapdos, meaning less Thunderbolt power and more Snorlax bulk, it's still not pleasant. Uh, Snorlax hates sand so much, so... Uh, he goes for the BP, but of course I can understand BPing if he's got a good response to it. Thing is, he doesn't really have a great response to the Lax uh, if he's going to Blissey. So, I mean, this means some trickery's afoot. Either, uh, so that mean actually I think that means uh, if he had like a Metagross or something, then yeah, because Metagross also threatens Magdal teams with, um, alongside Zapdos, especially with Sand still up. So, you know, get him in before Snorlax has a chance to Beast Land pair him, get him in fresh mess with the other team, don't let him get chipped into Trapper range too easily, make him work for it, get a lot of worth out of it. But he doesn't have a Metagross. Uh, instead, so Blissey means, I don't know, he's going to Ice Beam Freeze, he's going to counter, or he's going to sing. Uh, nothing, nothing will, uh, nothing will really strike fear in Strongx's heart, and he can be careful. So he goes for the sing, uh, the legendary Asta tech. Which is really nasty, because Sleep is strong, and Blissey has a lot of opportunities to use it. So, uh, it can shut something off, like as threatening as Titar, Snorlax, or Metagross. It's huge. Skarmory, too. So, he shuts it off, and now he's going to try to just chip it with Sand. So, at least, I'm going to assume Solwind used Curse there, because we're assuming it is a Curse Lax, because no, you wouldn't use any other Snorlax on a team with Zapdos that intends to die to Titar lead, because... Uh, you know, it's it's especially defensive Zapdos too, and alongside this uh, Curse Lax, then it almost surely had Rain Dance just to be another Weather Clearer, uh, if given the chance. So it uh it definitely it definitely is a Curse Rest Lax. That's the entire point. You remove the sand and then you unleash a Curse Rest Lax uninhibited by sand. So uh, now Solwyn goes to Metagross and Sing Number Two connects as well. So we don't know ABR's team yet, we don't know if he's got his own Trapper, and Sing Bliss plus Trappers is nasty for exactly this reason. Uh, Doug, and even Mag, but especially Doug, you know, for T-Tars and Metas, and even weakened Laxes. You know, look at that, that measly Seismic Toss, which you think, well, Snorlax has, you know, well over 400 HP, sometimes even 500, why is that even a threat? But in Sand, you know, suddenly, that's a that's a 5 hit KO, that's, that's pretty scary. So... And sing duration tends to be long, so... But we can see from this that ABR is seriously struggling against uh, the Snorlax. So it was T-Tar and some stuff that doesn't want to switch in. So, uh, he's gonna... Solwyn is ready for the Doug switch because he goes to Suicune. And Blissey... Or Solwyn... Or, uh, sorry, ABR stays in and Seismic Toss is just trying to chip the Metagross. Maybe trying to get it into Doug range. Maybe trying to catch a Snorlax double. Instead, he gets Suicune, and Suicune uh, pops a Rain Dance. So, this is almost surely the UD Suicune set. Substitute, Calm Mind, Rain Dance, and Surf. And its purpose is, well, 
traditionally these rain dance uh these die to t-tar dug it change the weather teams like call my rest suicune because like snorlax it feels similarly invincible without the presence of sand but this set is also great because it's uh sometimes hard to fit a rain dancer on your team uh, because, you know, Zapdos, and sometimes you want to let Zapdos die, and sticking it on Magneton or Dugshow is not the most reliable thing. So, uh, this Suicune set, while it's not going to surf rest against everything, it's not going to rest all everything, but it's still got some great longevity, especially if Solwyn's packing a spinner, which he almost surely is, probably Claydol, because it's uh, the most reliable, and packs, uh, gives him more T-Tar insurance. Uh, so if he is doing that, then he, um... Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought after yammering on for so long. So, alright, so even though the Suicune is not going to have maximum longevity with Rest, with Sub and Rain Dance, it's and a Spinner, then it's going to not have to deal with Spikes, ideally. It's not going to have to deal with... Uh, it's not going to have to deal with Sand, so it could come in on good switches and heal up. Just with Leftovers, so that's a, a big factor of why the Suicune is so good. And, of course, Subcall Mind, while switching into a Blissey Seismic Toss, I mean, this set beats Blissey switching in. It's not going to beat it uh, in, um, you know, if it's switching into it, because it only can create so many substitutes, but it's not trying to beat it. It just wanted to get that rain out of the way, and suddenly that whole sing and wear down Snorlax routine is becoming a lot harder, because now Snorlax has lefties, and the sand is not coming back. Also, the reason I say that uh, ABR, or sorry, that Solwyn has a Spinner instead of a Magneton is because that's the preferred way to deal with Skarmory Spikes. Because if you mag the Skarm and they still have Spikes, then they can still mess with your Snorlax more uh, and your Suicune just by phasing it around with Spikes. So Spinners are generally preferred, and uh, Claydol and Starmie both add some important defensive utility to the team, so that's why. So now he's going to sub up and not get the sub broken. So I wasn't really crazy about that one because he call mines and I mean he loses only a little bit of HP and burns some seismic toss PP. So that's nice. But I think since he wound up switching to Snorlax after this would have just been the superior choice. So uh, ABR goes to Swamper, which is def you know it's it's better than Blissey, but not by much. Uh, especially, and against a Cursed Snorlax, it might not, it might as well not exist. So, I don't know what possessed ABR to run Roar on a Swampert with, um, no, with no spikes. Because Roar Swampert is rare even with spikes, but, uh, you know, for occasions like this, I, I'm gonna say maybe that's exactly what he was afraid of, so props on that. And, uh, maybe he was afraid of SD Pass Celebi in particular, because these kind of, uh, more balancey, slow-paced teams give a lot of free turns to Celebi, and give it a lot of opportunities and uh, so it's a really nice call for uh, for that in particular because SD Pass Celebi is a very jarring team style to play against if you're not prepared and you know when you're not dishing out so much damage then you give it a lot of opportunities because it's so bulky and it sticks around forever with Recover and Leech Seed and then you pass to an Agilagross and the world ends so you uh, so good on ABR for that and it's helping against Curse Lax. Uh, as well, although not a lot because as you saw that body slam did a ton and Solwyn's last is revealed to be Starmie so Starmie is going to help stall uh, Solwyn's team, so it's not Claydol, uh, it helps against Moltres for sure Moltres could be fairly annoying if it's uh, forcing Snorlax to rest and is paired with Dugtrio and which is semi-rare but still something to consider uh, just forcing Snorlax to rest every time is not great and because uh, Suicune can't rest, so it can't answer it. So good call with Starmie there. Double water generally is nice for dealing with this kind of thing. And Natural Cure means that he doesn't have to choose between Refresh on Claydol and uh, giving up on Explosion, which would suck. So I, I like the choice of Starmie there. So Starmie comes in, and ABR reveals his own Starmie. So he's definitely packing a very slow-paced balance team that tries to switch around as much as possible and give CB Tar, and by taking the game at a slow pace, he gets, especially with the BP Zapdos into CB Tar, he'll get Tar a lot of safe opportunities to bust stuff up. Only problem is that Dugshio throws a uh, thorn in that. So Solwind uh, was afraid of Thunderbolt. He reveals, so Solwind, uh, ABR reveals T-Wave. 
And as soon as he revealed T-Wave, I'm thinking, maybe you gotta go back to Star Army, because, I, you know, see, let's go back a few turns. So, uh, here you got, you're, you're afraid of T-Wave, right? So, or T-Bolt, so you go to Snorlax, and you get T-Wave, and you're like, okay, well, whatever, I get some leftovers, that's good. Now I'm going back to Star Army, because this might happen. Uh, you know, it's not doing a lot with leftovers, the Surf, but, you know, chain a couple of these together, and then you get to rest, and you might get picked off by a Dug Trio that could be there. So, that is really ugly. So, I think going back to Starmie was safer, because, you know, uh, you know, Star Starlings would have been paired, but it also gets to heal up against Blissey, uh, super free. And, uh, and Seismic Toss can't crit, which is the big, uh, which is the selling point of that. So I was a, I was kind of apprehensive because now Snorlax full paras twice and he has to go for a curse. Now everyone's thinking, oh my god, what are you doing? But it's important because otherwise he rests and he might get picked off by Doug Trio. So I believe in that. And plus he still had two opportunities or, you know, one to not full para if he got crit. So that had to go badly. But now his Snorlax is, at, is fresh and at full HP because, you know, it's going to get roared out without doing any damage. But at least he's healthy, which is more important. And Suicune gets roared in, gets more lefties, that's great. So basically, ABR's team hinges a lot on teams being able, teams crumpling to CB Tar and offensive Zapdos, and both of those are great, but in, instead of fostering an environment where uh, he breaks through their dedicated checks by doubling up on targets, like for example, pairing T Tar with uh, something like a Metagross to further break holes and cover defensive utility against Lax. Uh, or like a Salamence mate. I mean, the last lot could be Salamence, Arrow, Doug, Metagross. No, definitely not Metagross. It's definitely not a solid rock resist. You know, even Jirachi, I think, would have been better against Lax. Who knows? Like a Wish Call mindset, which reminds me of a team uh, McMegan likes to run sometimes. Point point being that instead of, uh, uh, you know, f facilitating the Zapdos with stuff that removes special walls like Doug Trio and, you know, Boom Lords, then he's, uh, he's stuck these two... Um, these two offensive juggernauts that work really well together against teams that aren't, that only like check them as opposed to countering them. And not that you really counter CB Tar over the course of the game, but Doug Trio, you know, gets in the way of you being able to use it against everything. And Zapdos can be easily walled. So uh, that's what's backfiring for him right now. I think the idea of the team is good. I personally would do something different because I'm sorry if that sounds arrogant. But we all have preferences, of course. But point being, that is why uh, ABR's team is struggling here. So I'm starting to get the hiccups after two hours of yammering straight. Anyway, so uh, ABR right now, unless he reveals a last that's a bit more of a juggernaut, then he's not able to hurt ABR's team at all. Because Starmie has 32 reco PP recover and uh, natural cure, and Snorlax is immovable. So uh, he just... You know, he's not scratching it at all. And Snorlax can be, like, pretty much the worst thing ever to have on a team. But he also has, you know, in a situation like this, this is what you shoot for when you're using uh, Snorlax, when you're using this style of team. You're like, well, Snorlax is the worst against Sand and Spikes, but you remove Sand and Spikes and suddenly he's a monster. So, and I think uh, Solon's team is more well-rounded than some other uh, attempts at this. Because uh, instead of you know going all in on the Magneton and uh, and the Claydol and the Milotic, then he's stranding it with Pokemon that are actually threats uh, on their own and are more multifaceted rather than going all in on an all or nothing Snorlax uh, sweep. So he's not taking any chances with the Sleeping Metaros getting dug because that is a very likely last with the BP Dug Trio and the Sing Blissey. Those are both prime uh, Pokemon to lure in others like Celebi and Blissey and then dug them, especially a bulky dug to get rid of opposing Bliss. That's why Solwyn was so careful with his curses. You know, there's no reason to unnecessarily get messed up by it. So now ABR is forced to go for a freeze and he throws out three and doesn't get him. So now he reveals the Dugtrio last. So I do like Dugtrio as the Pokemon on that team. Uh, because it facilitates the T-Tar Blissey, uh, the Zapdos Blissey dynamic. And uh, CB Tar Dog is uh, actually a surprisingly potent combo. But I personally would have run a Metagross over Swampert. As, because in addition to being a rock resist, well, you have uh, Blissey for DD Mence. 
and Mets has good resist or meta has good resist and it also checks normal types so that that is the main idea I think that would be a pretty good team uh, of course I really like the idea of ABR's team overall uh, and arguably you could even say that Celebi would be a good choice here because actually I'd used uh, Celebi over Blissey on an offensive team I had. Oh, sorry, it's not about me, but I'm just saying that it's a good special wall while maintaining momentum with Baton Pass to further get Induction. And with Leech Seed, it's actually a Snorlax switch. And you don't have to worry about uh, being weaker to Moltres, which is one of the few special Pokemon Celebi can't handle, because of Starmie. And uh, Titar and Duxio handle Calm Minders. So I, that's another idea. I think Meta over Pert or Celebi over Blissey might have been better. But I like the idea of Sing Blissey alongside BP, Zapdos, and Duxio, and Starmie for defensive utility. Alongside Tar as well for, phys for pure physical pressure. So much that I would prefer to rather uh, stick Metagross in as the physical wall. Anyway, that aside, then now he's got a crit with Doug or it is pretty much game over. He doesn't get it and Doug drops. So Zapdos has to crit at some point, has to crit too, like right here, and uh, he doesn't get it. So there was that, uh, and there was nothing really Solwyn could have done to like, I mean, in theory he could have like gone to Dugtrio or something because Dugtrio is kind of worthless and, you know, tried to, but the thing is if he like switches Snorlax in and out to get more leftovers, then he has to get it. He has to get it a lot more to get it out of crit range. Because, you know, you can't calc a Snorlax EV spread, so I won't even bother. But let's just say, since these T-Bolts seem to be ranging from 25 to 28, let's just say the average is like 26, so a crit would do 52. You know, he would have to get a, you know, if we go back a few turns. Uh, he's at 35 when the Zapdos attempts to crit it. You know, that's so many more switches and switches out uh, for before he would be able to lefties out of crit range, so I don't think that was feasible. So he just had to, you know, pray there. I mean, I guess if he had a T-Wave Starmie, then he could have tried that. That might have been worth it, actually. But we don't know if the Starmie had T-Wave or something else. So he goes for Body Slam and doesn't get crit by any of these attacks. Um, and we don't know if he has T-Wave or not, but he switches out, and, you know, since the last two are walled, then... Yeah, that was a great game, and as always, Zapdos is such a massive threat that, you know, he had a couple shots to freeze. Well, he can also thaw out, but a crit with Doug or one of one, two, three, four, uh, five T bolts. I don't know. Does any one T bolt crit? Well, the first one definitely does. Um, it depends on rolls, actually, because I think if he crits the first T bolt and then he still has another turn of rest, I don't know if it uh, turns it from a 4 KO into a 3 at KO. Uh, from, actually, it's a 5 KO with lefties. Uh, so, any, anyway, point being that it was up to the odds then. But who knows? Uh, I, maybe he wanted to go to Dugtrio just to play it safe and, you know, rock slide it. If he's bulky, he can live in HP grass. Maybe. Well, maybe. Um, it would have been dangerous because if he had T-Wave Starmie, I think that was the better route. But if he didn't, then, you know, that, that was fine as well. It shows how fragile these kinds of Curse Lax teams can be. So, um, you know, when they're just a couple, they're just always feel like one well-timed crit away, but, um, you know, and these teams are always going to have holes, which is what happens when you are forced to sacrifice one of your Pokemon to get rid of the sand, but I think this is a great example of how these teams can be dangerous, so great job on both ends. Once again, you know, we've had three incredibly quality games here from two incredible players, both teams and plays department, you know, I'm very pleased. Anyway, Solwyn leads 2-1, and uh, he took uh, advance, which he was not expected to. I think that was definitely in ABR's favor. And uh, while he was less favored to win advance than ABR was to win black and white, then, uh, you know, it's, it's still a surprise. So, you know, he drops black and white, he wins advance, who knows. Anyway, GSC. Now... ABR was favored in advance, but he was definitely favored in GSC because he's shown it to be one of his best tiers, and Solon has struggled in the tier in the past, so this one was definitely in the favor, and uh, yeah, so here we go, GSC, as we turn off this, and we go to, is it on loop? Yeah, it is, cool. We go to this. So, two Snorlax leads. They're going to double-edge each other. 
which is erotic actually and uh, so they get similar roles they're at functionally similar uh, equivalent HP with uh, recoil and you know how showdown rounds up so they both do 36 to each other then they both switch to their spiker cloister surfs fortress fortress goes for a toxic that's crucial because it uh, will allow well in the short term cloister is going to beat Fori. In the longer term, if Fortress manages to spin and Cloyster, uh, especially if he's got Giga Drain, and Cloyster manages to, um, if Cloyster is forced to switch in later, then it's going to be hampered. That's Fortress's strength, being stronger and stronger as the game goes on. Well, Cloyster gets worn down because Fury is toxic immune, and uh, spins well, spins and can explode. We don't know what kind of team Avir is running yet, although, you know, you can't really say toxic so stall team. It's because uh, offensive teams can run toxic very feasibly too, because it forces. Exploding for little damage. So you could go either way, but yeah, so Cloyster Surfs. Cloyster Surfs again. Strong move on Solwyn's end. Rather than going for the spikes, he's deciding, I'm bringing Fori down. I'm aware that uh, Cloyster gets worse the longer the game goes on once it's been toxic, and Fori. If you let Fori heal, he's a huge pain in the ass, so that was a huge move. Uh, ABR doesn't want to fall behind and not get spikes while Solwyn spikes, so he's pretty much forced into spiking. So, we uh, I think that was a really heads-up move by Solwyn, uh, really keeping the game in mind. And now we're in a tough position because ABR has to... You know, if Solwyn goes for a third serve, Fori just, just dies for nothing, and then Cloyster will spike freely and, you know... That's a very bad way to be 6-5. At least he got spikes out of it. So I think this is a very free spike for Solwind. So ABR reveals Protect. Now Protect Fori is underrated, but it's hard to fit on a team. I used to use Toxic Spikes, Protect, Rapid Spin. No, not Toxic Spikes. Toxic and Spikes. Uh, because Toxic Spikes don't exist in GSC, of course. And it, it's great, but Fortress often really... It, it's great against Cloyster, for sure. And nice against things like uh, Machamp and Snorlax and not worrying about exploding into normal resists like uh, Titar, Golem, uh, Rhydon. But it also, and it doesn't get worn down by phasing from Raikou in particular, which is why I really like it. Um, so it's a great move. Sometimes a lot of teams will want coverage on Fury, like Giga Drain, HP Fire, HP Ghost, Explosion. But Protect is really nice. Problem is, this is not a great place to use Protect because... I mean, if he surfs, that's great, but it's a very free... I mean, it's not completely free because, of course, ABR could say, well, I'm going to spam spin if he tries to spike and, you know, he's going to take toxic damage. But realistically, that's just so not worth it because eventually he could just surf and kill you in 6-5 and, you know, better to preserve Fori. So this Protect, on one hand, it does... It, it does give Fori a little more health because it means when it comes back in, it's going to be at 26 if the spikes go up. Which they do. Uh, but now he's got to switch into the Surf, which is, you know, fine. Uh, someone's not going to be booming into a Raikou this early. That would be incredibly ballsy. Um, if it is a Raikou. It's an Electric, almost surely. But, I mean, it could be a Gengar. Uh, so Surf is just the safest. So he throws out a Surf. Strong move. And now Raikou's in, taking a lot of damage with the Spikes and the decently powered Surf. So now we don't know what kind of Raikou it is. Is it Rest Talk to shrug off Zapdos and Jinx and keep going? Or is it Roar? So uh, we talked about Roar being used as an offensive weapon in the black and white game, and GSC is one of the best examples of that in action, where Roar Raikou is famous for shuffling through so much of the tier. It shuffles through a ton of Pokemon on every team, and a lot of teams are just like waiting to get their Snorlax back in on it so they can actually hit it. So uh, we're going to find that out soon, and Solwyn reveals a Steelix. As Raikou goes for Thunderbolt, so we're definitely facing some sort of stall team. Dealing with some sort of stall team from ABR. He, uh, because an offensive team would be a lot likely to run Thunder to put pressure on Snorlax. But the stall team needs the reliability of Thunderbolt against Vaporeon in particular. So, uh, Steelix is a great Pokemon. And, uh, okay, I've said Steelix is horrible in GSC in the past. And I normally stand by that because against Snorlax it kind of sucks but against Stall it's really nasty because it waltzes in on Raikou and Skarm can't phase it because the slower phase in GSC works and the faster one fails and it shuffles spikes all over the place the only problem is that Fori absolutely ruins it 
And that's why I think if you're going to run Steelix, it pretty much has to be paired with Gengar. So, uh, yeah, so now he's got a Roar. And uh, so I think Zap- Steelix is really bad against Zapdos and friends. But against Raikou and friends, then Steelix can be pretty nasty. So uh, I tend to prefer Golem overall, but Steelix... If there was a matchup in which Steelix shines, it's this, especially because Fori is still so weakened. Now, the thing that can happen is, uh, earlier we said, well, he can just spin and then, you know, force the Cloyster to KO him, and then he'll just go to it, and, you know, what's he going to do after to prevent the Cloyster from roaring, he to from spiking again? He would have to go to his Roar Raikou and force it in 16 million times with spikes until it died. So, uh, not reliable at all. <laughs> and so that's why it just was not worth it to let Fori go, especially because Fori can get an opportunity against a Steelix spamming Roar later. So, um, but with Fori weakened, then Steelix definitely likes that. So Suicune comes in, we're seeing some double dog action, and uh, some classic stall, and he reveals Skarmory with a Roar. So here, the whirlwind fails, and the Roar continues on. Here comes Raikou again, and talk about facing as a weapon, you know, Raikou does it, but then Steelix turns it, uh, does the same thing to Raikou. So, Raikou's better overall, but Steelix can be really nasty. So, Skarmory comes in instead of Suicune to minimize Spike's damage, Snorlax comes in. We don't know what kind of lax this is, it can be anything. Uh, ABR is generally known for favoring Rest Talk lax for its defensive security against Zapdos and Jinx, so one bad thing happening to Raikou does not necessarily mean death. You know, it's got some good coverage, it's still a noise offense even without boosting, especially with a toxic cloister, meaning it's a lot uh, less, it's a lot more difficult to take advantage of. So, uh, we don't know if he doesn't want to risk an earthquake or an explosion, and he goes back to Skarmory and Fortress gets dragged in. So here's the problem. So Cloyster comes in on the top, and Cloyster takes toxic damage as it switches in, and if he, you know, had its, got its spikes down, uh, you can't see, but with his new feature on uh, Showdown, then you get to see all the field conditions. Uh, it's really cool. So you see he's got his spikes up, even though you can't see him on the field. So if you're ever lost, for, then you just hover over the turn marker. This works in an actual live battle, too, and you will be able to see. So in modern gen, you'll see stuff like uh, Tailwind and Trick Room and Gravity and whatever. So uh, Fortress is now threatening the spin, and uh, let's look at the handy dandy damage calc. Steelix, Fori, Earthquake, it's a roll to kill, but he's also got Protect. Uh, yeah, which is... Uh, so, you know, he can Protect out of Steelix EQ range, and if he spins on Cloyster, that's ugly, so we're getting faced with a lot of nasty guessing games, but someone's got Gengar. So that is... See, this is where Steelix shines, when he gets the phasing going against Raikou, Suicune, and friends, and he's got the Gengar to back him up against the Fori. This is where Steelix shines, uh, especially because Gengar is such a humongously threatening Pokemon to begin with. So, uh, Fori reveals HP Fire, so he's a spinless Fori, and at that point, it becomes very obvious that ABR is running a redux of the uh, Double Dogs Golem stall he and I worked on two years ago, and he uh, revised the set to include this Fortress, which I think it's a, it's a cool set. Uh, because you Toxic Cloister and Starmie, and you HP Fire other Fori, and you remain healthy with your own Fori uh, to consistently relay spikes and toxic things, and uh, you leave the actual spinning to Golem, and you facilitate Golem spinning by poisoning Cloister, so Golem is able to uh, is able to spin and force Cloister to come back in and eat poison and lay the spike again and whatnot. So. Uh, Gengar, but it's sinister against Gengar. Uh, of course, the idea that is that G- Gengar does not spin block Golem because it does not uh, at all. But, um, but you know, it's still coming in for free against Fortress, and that can be really ugly because Gengar is just such a menace. So protect, and Gengar uses Mean Look. So everyone's thinking, uh oh. Well, Mean Look is. Uh, traditionally with Parasong it can be really nasty against a non-phaser and when you don't run a phasing Raikou then your phaser because uh, it's why Ms. Dravis runs Thunder on its traditional Paris trapping set you know why it's not going to get anywhere unless you are able to hit the most common phaser in Skarmory and that's why Roar Raikou is so good against it so those teams would generally try to force Roar Raikou to sleep with uh, an electric or status and uh, then they sick their Mistravis on the opposing team. Anyway, so 
If it's not a phasing Raikou, then it could be that. It also could be an offensive mean look Gengar, which is uh, something ABR was toying with uh, a couple months ago. And I think he gave it to Sulcata, and Sulcata used it against um, Diophantine, I think, in SPL. And it was really nasty. So uh, I think that's I think that's more likely than uh, given the current trends. You can you know when you see a set like that, that's kind of got your buttons. It's kind of got you thinking, huh? Okay, I'm uh, keeping an eye on this. Then, like with the Spit F Heatran uh, in DPP, you know, yeah, it could be per uh, Roar or Toxic Last, but if you're keeping up with the current trends, then you know it's very likely Explosion because that's the most relevant and definitely the best in this meta game. And you know, with his team, it works. So we don't know what Solon's got, but it is almost guaranteed he has a Zapdos uh, standard Rest Talk set because it's such a threat to uh, every team, offense and stall alike, especially offense once Gengar is facilitating it by drag, uh, by forcing in and really messing with Snorlax or, and Raikou. So, um, especially if it's like Parasong and it mean looks a uh, non-EQ lax, which is a lot of them. So, here comes the Raikou and he just goes for a T-Bolt. And so Raikou's at low health now, so, you know, ABR is definitely on the back foot because you know, if he's predicting an explosion, this is an incredibly tough time to pull it off. Because ABR, or, um, someone can feasibly just switch to Steelix. So, you know, what's he going to do? Try to catch the explosion with Skarmory? Well, Steelix still handles that, you know. Back to Fori? Uh, and the thing is that Raikou is going to get weaker and weaker uh, if he doesn't heal. Think of the black and white game and how Reuniclus had to heal once it took the knockoff. Well, here, because spikes are down, then Raikou's going to have to heal eventually, and it needs to be healthy to deal with um, Zapdos, especially because Snorlax is also at 55% with spikes down and no immediate way of getting rid of them. So he's got to stay in, and if someone pulls the trigger with Boom, it's nasty. He HP Ices or Waters looking for Steelix, and so that makes me think Rest Talk more than Roar, so he's uh, trying to not give up uh, momentum by resting against a very offensive team, which is uh, very reminiscent of one of the best GSC players in Fear. And someone pulls the trigger and blows it up. So that is huge. Now, he's not going to have his spin block for uh, Golem, and you know he doesn't have to spin block for you anymore. Uh, so that's big for Steelix, but he goes to Zapdos, and that was absolutely the right move, because Zapdos, it's as simple as Zapdos destroys everything, but if you look at it, you know, a little more intensely, it's, uh, well, Fori drops, Suicune drops, Su uh, Skarmory drops, obviously, Snorlax is forced to rest immediately, and thus Solwyn can go on the offensive with his Steelix, which is now a major threat. We don't know his last, it could be something like a Machamp or uh, a Jinx, and uh, if he blows up the Suicune, then Machamp or Jinx like that. And, you know, his Cloyster can boom as well, so he's just trying to blow up as much of the opposing team as possible to isolate a positive matchup for his remaining pokes. Zapdos and the final Pokemon, which is going to be some sort of cleaner. So, uh, Zapdos destroys everything, and Golem, of course, it's not going to be HP Water, uh, most likely, but HPI still does a ton to Golem. And he chips it, so now at least Cloyster is going to get spikes later, and Go Golem's not going to come into the Cloyster, so Golem is going to take spikes damage and thus be more chipped when it comes in and tries to spin again later. So, uh, so, so you know, both players had to make the plays they made. One could say, oh, well, ABR maybe could have exploded on the Zapdos, but I think uh, spinning and trying to preserve his own Snorlax was also just as fine. If you explode on the uh, Cloyster uh, without spinning, then that really sucks. Because, you know, Golem goes down and then Zapdos just runs through the team. So I think S Spin was absolutely the correct move. So now uh, Solon makes a great move, goes to Cloyster. As uh, ABR tries to play it safe and heal with his Snorlax. I guess you could say that if there was a time to boom the Golem, it was there. Because it was going to live another hidden power. And if Cloyster comes in, then you blow that up, and Solon's not getting spikes back up. And your Snorlax uh, will thus have its survivability regained, and Zapdos uh, is not as much of a threat by default anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I think that might have been feasible. But I guess I get also playing it uh, safe and going to Snorlax because Solwyn could have tried to absorb the boom with uh, Steelix, which he does. Steelix is not nearly as important now without uh, Raikou to mess around with. I mean, he can try to blow up the Suicune, 
but it depends on his last whether it's big or not. If it's a Jinx, then yeah, that's helpful, but Jinx also struggles against Rest Talk Lax, so uh, it it was a tough call. I think, but I think Golem might have benefited from booming there. If you blow up the Zapdos, you blow up the Zapdos. But actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, maybe not. Because if you blow up the Zapdos and then the, uh, snor uh, the Cloyster comes back and gets spikes and then probably booms something else, then that's still you're. Uh, that's more of a negative for it. Because uh, let's say Golem booms Zapdos and then it's uh, four four, and then Cloyster gets uh, spikes and booms something. I mean, maybe not because it's toxic. So Skarmory might try to stand against it, and Fori has protect. But, you know, it's still going to be, it's still likely going to be 3-3 three, three with spikes and, you know, uh, it, it depends on the last, a lot depends on the last. So I could see booming, I could see not booming. Uh, so I think someone made a good play knowing ABR likes to, I mean, ABR doesn't necessarily like to play it safe. It's, uh, you know, he's definitely shown a huge capability for, you know, pulling triggers uh, in big situations when he needs it. So I'm gonna say that I don't know if I'm missing something But blow yeah blowing up both Zapdos and Cloyster with Golem I think was better rather than accepting that Because um, you see when you don't blow it up then they're both still around to terrorize the team and at least getting rid of one of them and uh, Would have been good I think because let's see Golem Golem is Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Golem is not coming in again safely. Yeah, okay, I, I definitely think that should have been an explosion. Because before, at least before, Golem could take two HP Aces from Zapdos and spin and boom. But now it's going to be forced. And the next time it comes in, wherever that is, I mean, best case, sleeping lax. But um, that doesn't have sleep talk. But even then, I, I guess that was what he was shooting for. But I think that wasn't as much of a threat. Well, I guess because Golem is his uh, Fire Lax counter, he might not have Explosion also. I know ABR has run Rest Golem on stall before. And actually, that would make a lot of sense because if it's his Fire Lax counter, he needs it to stay healthy. So, I think I think that's a more reasonable, reasonable uh, explanation. That he was Rest Golem, or maybe even Curse Rest Golem, which is a great set. And he was... Um, he uh, was... He needed to preserve it for the Lax... So, I don't know if uh, someone might have known that, and, you know, because, hmm, I, I don't know. But either way, I think that was a good move. If he was, if he was boom, I still think he should have boomed it. So, I'm going to say that it was probably not boom. Because I think, uh, yeah, Clo Golem will not get another opportunity like it did against the Zapdos there. It had to do that. So, anyway, Cloyster gets up spikes, and uh, Snorlax rests up to be healthy, because he's going to have to accept that he's going to deal with spikes now. Uh, Cloyster goes for Surf, trying to hit Skarmory, and it is a Sleep Talk Lax, revealing Earthquake. So now uh, someone goes to Steelix on the Skarmory rather than get boomed. So now he's still in a good position, fails the Roar, Golem gets dragged in, 48%, and Steelix is going to curse up, uh, which would be fine against Earthquake and Rapid Spin alike. Suicune comes in, and now here's the ballsy, here's, here's the tough part, because... Solwyn very well can just go to Zapdos and be fine against both Suicune and Skarmory and put massive pressure on Snorlax, which is at 89 before Spikes, and then continue the pressure. Uh, we don't, still don't know his last, which is also, you know, really uh, such a huge uh, threat because, you know, uh, when you're struggling against these guys that have been shown and you don't even know what the last is, so it's tough to know what to preserve. And it could feasibly be so many things. I don't think there's anything Solon has really played toward that has really made it so obvious as to what it is. I mean, if Gengar was so eager to boom on Raikou, yeah, maybe it's not a Machamp. Maybe it's a special sweeper, but, you know, Vaporeon or Jinx. Because, uh, I mean, if it's Vaporeon, then Solon's in some trouble anyway. Uh, but, you know, if it's Jinx, then, you know, he's going to have one of Suicune or uh, Snorlax. So those are the most likely last. Uh, Executor is also a possibility. But yeah, so he could feasibly go to Zapdos here and be fighting a Suicune or Snorlax and put more pressure on the Lax. Uh, Suicune or Skarmory, sorry, and put more pressure on the Lax that's forced to switch in because Golem is struggling to take HP Ice at this point. And, uh, or he could, and he does go to Zapdos. 
and he gets toxic. So great move by uh, uh, ABR there to read the situation and saying, yeah, I'm not going to risk a boom on the, sn uh, on the Scarb. I'm just going to go to my lax and put pressure. And here comes Golem, just to, you know, getting worn down even more because uh, he's still in, uh, he's fearing HP Ice. Now, uh, you know, the Toxic is not a backbreaker on Zapdos. It does run Rest Talk, and does, uh, so it's going to be able to heal and remain a threat while healing. As a matter of fact, Golem always dies to HP Ice here. So, uh, all, so someone can just keep HP Icing. He gets uh, Snorlax in for free. So, matter of fact, I think the more this game plays out, the more I think he absolutely did not have Explosion. Because otherwise, he had to use it. Otherwise, he just let himself get put into this uh, disadvantageous position. So, Steelix is pretty good against... Or, actually, pretty great against the Snorlax set. Because even an Earthquake doesn't do very much. And he poses a threat with Curse Boom. Or, uh, with Roar Curse. And he just explodes right away. Great move. He uh, doesn't let the... he You know, that took a lot of guts. Because Skarmory could have come in to... Uh, uh, not take spikes damage so he could actually get Suicune in as opposed to getting Suicune roared out and bringing Skarmory in. So that was a really great read by Solwind. Um, I, I don't even know if it was necessary per se uh, to predict the Suicune, but at the same time, I don't think it was... Well, we'll get there. Uh, so Cloyster comes in threatening outspeeds and threatens everything else and uh, Skarmory's at full health so is going to go to it. And now uh, I think a, or someone should have exploded there because explosion does do slightly more to uh, Skarmory. So, uh, you know, actually quite a lot more. But it doesn't really matter because as you see here, Cloyster goes down and someone reveals his last to be Vaporeon, which is a humongous threat. So he really timed that Gengar and Raikou perfectly. And uh, he sacrifices Fori against Vap, who doesn't want to growth in case Skarm just whirlwinds. I mean, I don't think Skarm was risking the Whirlwind um, because it needed to stay alive to potentially handle a Curse EQ Lax. But, uh, you know, Snorlax still handle does a lot to Vaporeon. Snorlax is uh, double-edged, just unboosted. I mean, it's still not a good position for Lax because we saw Surf, not Hydro Pump. So, plus one Surf is doing this much that you can see. And you can also see how much an unboosted double-edge is doing. So, not too a KOing. So... When Snorlax is at 64%, uh, you know, I'm going to type in 63 because that's probably what it is and my 4 key is busted. So he has a slow chance low chance to 2 KO with a plus 1 Surf from this range. And with Double Edge Recoil adding on 9 to 10%, then yeah, he's in big, big trouble. So yeah, it's looking like someone's got it. And then he pulls out Acid Armor, which means he's definitely got, got it. Acid Armor is kind of a forgotten threat on Vaporeon. And, uh, but it makes sure that it handles Lax all the time, like one-on-one, -on -one, because at, if Lax is at full health and like curses up, then it's closer to a trade for both, or possibly a win for Snorlax if it's getting Body Slam Paras, but, uh, or if it has Return, actually, which is the best case scenario, but Acid Armor just dominates it one-on-one -on -one and prevents explosions from uh, taking it out from the likes of Cloyster, so now he's going to growth up and... It's looking like the Vaporeon is going to win the game for Soulwind and thus the series. As Double Edge, not breaking through, no crits. And next Surf comes up barely short. But, you know, Surf could have crit too, so whatever. And ABR forfeits and Soulwind finally wins his first individual trophy. So, uh, I'm kind of worn out at this point. It's been two and a half hours. But congratulations to both on an incredibly well-played and well-built series. Great teams all around. And, uh, yeah, congratulations to Solon, of, of course, uh, for becoming a top five player of all time. If it went to RBY, I think uh, people were favoring... I think it was mostly even, but I personally favored Solon because he had a lot of RBY experience. He won the RBY Cup last year. Um... I can't, uh, yeah, but, you know, people were looking highly at ABR's game as well, for good reason. So, I can't speak highly enough about these two players, and, uh, so I'm not going to, because I've been doing it for two and a half hours. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this, I hope you learned something from it, and I will catch you, uh, <laughs> next time. So, congrats to Solon once again, who, in my view, is a top five player of all time now for his ridiculous uh, achievements over the years. And, you know, ABR is ABR, so... 
Uh, not much more can be said about either, honestly. Could make a video dedicated to both of them uh, individually. And fill up even more hours. So, thank you once again. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. And I will catch you next time.